I'm going to go ahead and start with the introduction to the remote meeting while um, we're waiting for some of our friends to join us and then uh, come back to the member access roll call. So um, good evening. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of this meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and uh, take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless I note otherwise. Um, before we do our role, uh, before we do attendance, um, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to you and state your name before speaking. Um, if members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, and uh, finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. As a preliminary matter, um, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? I don't see her. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? In the affirmative. Mr. Hayner? Yes. And I'm Ms. Morgan, I am also here. Um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, Dr. Bodie? Here. Dr. McNeil? Here. Mr. Mason? Here. Uh, Mr. Spiegel? Here. Um, Ms. Elmer, I don't see her either. Um, and then um, Ms. Nolan from the AEA is here. Can you, you can hear us. Can we just make sure we can hear you? Hi there, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Hi. 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 Um, and then I see um, Ms. Franchi is here. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. And we can hear you. And um, Ms. Peretz is here. I'm looking around at my boxes. You can hear us. Can we can we hear you? Yes. Hello. Okay. Perfect. I'm looking to see. Nope. Nobody else. Okay. All right. Um. So we um, are going to go ahead because it's 6:35. Let me just quickly check in with Dr. Allison Ampey and see if there's. And otherwise, I want we can go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, so the first item on the agenda is public comment. Um, we did receive some emails that were sent to the full committee that are in the packet. 
there was one email that when I followed up with the gentleman who sent it, he requested that it be uh, be read as public comment, which I will do. So this is a comment from uh, Mr. David Levy. And his comment is, the district is currently planning for three potential scenarios for the fall. One, back to normal. Two, partial opening. And three, full remote learning. I also suggest the administration specialize these three scenarios for three distinct student groups. One, elementary. Two, middle school and three high school. There may be overlapping strategies between all three, but there are also significant differences in learning capacities, curriculum, and parent oversight. So that was the only one, as far as I know, that um, wanted to be read out loud. And I see Dr. Allison Ampey, can you hear us? Yes. And we can hear you, excellent. Um, Okay, so that's everything that we have for public comment. So the next item on the agenda is the fall reopening update. Dr. Bodhi. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I was I wanted to mention that Ms. Elmer is not going to be able to attend tonight. So with respect to fall planning, there's, there's two um, parts to this uh, presentation. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the highlights of the call the superintendents had today with Commissioner Riley. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Su Susan um, Frankie here with us, who is our director of nursing. And she's going to talk about uh, some of the safety protocols that we have been discussing and have, will have in place for the fall. So one of the things that the commissioner said in, when he opened in his opening remarks was this, some very good news for Massachusetts in that we are one of only four states in the country that are on track to containing the COVID virus. So that, that is very good news as we're sitting here in mid-July. At this point, uh, the Department of Education and the governor are continuing to encourage the option that as many students as possible are brought back to school in the fall. That is uh, the, the full reopening, though they couch it with saying as many students as possible to be able to come back. Some districts are going to have space issues, budget issues that, that may make that more difficult. Um, there clearly still remain some uncertainties as to what will happen in the fall. And of course, the, the, the major one is should we see a resurgence in Massachusetts? And we just really won't know that for a while. But there are other practical and budgetary um, issues as well. It does not appear that the state budget is going to be um, completed this summer as waiting to see what the tax revenues will be and really what, um, what kind of aid they will get from the federal government. So as Mr. Levy mentioned in his public comment, yes, there are three components to a plan for every district. One component is bringing back as many students as possible. The, third, the second is a hybrid plan where you have some students in uh, part of the week or every other week and other students come the following, uh, they alternate. The third uh, component is the full, uh, full remote. And the plan for each of these three components um, needs to be submitted to the Department of Education by uh, July 31st. The commissioner has asked districts um, to wait until early August to make some final decisions for the fall, uh, just waiting to, to see again, uh, to eliminate as many of the possible, possible obstacles that could happen for your plan. In Arlington right now, we're in the stage of actually measuring rooms. Uh, the Department of Education has created a calculator, which is help. It's really more of a, a check on the measuring that goes on. One of the things I think all of our schools are finding is that th there's not as much uniformity as you would think between the size of uh, classrooms. So we're, we're getting a complete grid on what the size of all the classrooms are and how many students um, they can um, 
have in the room using the three foot distance. Uh, the, the type of grid that we're using is not a rectangular grid. It is a grid in which the desks are on a diagonal, which um, actually gives more of a sense of space than you would in a rectangular grid. And possibly in some cases, not all cases, it allows more desks in the room. So we are at that stage right now, but parallel to all of that, we are also planning around all three of the options that that we're required to give a plan for. And certainly one of the things that we also are potentially considering is, is there a different plan um, at different levels? And that is something that we would have to address in our plan if that was the case. So one of the other things that we learned is that next week there's going to be a video released and which I will make available on our website to all parents and staff and the school committee from the medical community on safety issues of reopening. Um, we learned that the transportation guidelines as they had stated earlier will be released in August. However, some preliminary guidance is that uh, the, it'll be three feet apart on the bus in terms of the number of students that can, be, uh, can travel on the bus and all students both uh, kindergarten and first grade will not be, not that they're exempt right now, but it will be mandatory that all students have a mask on the bus. There will be guidelines in terms of um, cleaning, the, cleaning the bus between runs and all of that will be coming. But one of the things that was important, I think, for um, districts that, that rely on transportation, we're very fortunate in, in Arlington that the vast majority of our students uh, do not take um, a a bus to school, at least a school bus to school. And um, that if a district needs to have double runs, there's going to be um, potentially some give on terms of uh, time and learning hours. As you know, there are two requirements that districts face. One is that we have to complete 180 days in the school year. But in addition to that, um, different levels have to complete a certain number of learning hours. At the secondary level in Arlington, it is 990 hours, and at the elementary, it's 900. But um, one of the things that um, the Board of Education in June voted is that if the, if the governor were to declare a state of emergency, or there were some exigent conditions in terms of the virus or, or something else that we're not even thinking of, uh, the, the commissioner has the ability to modify the school year and to modify time on learning. At this point, there is no modification to the number of school days required, and there's no modification to the number of time and learning hours. Uh, in terms of further notices, extracurricular and sports will be coming in a couple weeks. Uh, next week, an FAQ will be will be on the DESI website. I'll create a link and send it to everybody. Um, and that will, be an on, that will be updated regularly. One of the things that actually was um, uh, something that I had talked, I had asked this question before, and there's been a modification on the answer, and that is the issue of a remote option. I, I think that our, the Department of Education and medical community realize that there are some students um, who would be, it would be too risky for them to be in school, in, no matter what in-school model we had, and may need to uh, remain out of school. And that may be true because they live with parents or grandparents that also may be, um, have a fragile medical condition. So the state recognizing this is allowing districts to have a remote option uh, for students because we are required to provide education for students. There's, there's a lot more that we'll have to look at in terms of this and that is um, the whether what the time frame would be. There's a lot of there's a lot of issues around it but this is opening the door to that possibility. The other thing that the, the, court, the uh, state is doing is they're also looking into um, a management uh, uh, learning uh, a learning platform that districts can subscribe to for students to engage in um, 
learning remotely that would be self-directed. So that is one possible option for the direction the district could go, but we can also potentially create our own remote learning option. And that's actually something that we are in the process of doing right now. Um, the other thing that the Department of Education um, also encouraged districts to not do is to do any assessments in the first few weeks of school. And, and that's a conclusion that we had pretty much come to as well. There has to be a, a, a really a focus on adjusting back to school and um, some review, SEL issues. So, uh, but the Department of Education will be creating some assessments that could be administered later in the first month or early in the second month that will give us an idea as to where students, um, uh, where they are in terms of benchmarks. And then there's gonna be other guidance that's coming along in terms of sharing the materials. We've already begun talking about that as well. And then mass breaks. We have a little bit more information today. As you remember last time we said that they were going to have mass breaks during the day. And the question is where would they happen and what would be the conditions under which, which they could happen. And they can, you have to be six feet apart. So they're encouraging, of course, outdoors uh, to, to use it, to do a mask break. But if you did it indoors, you have to maintain the six feet. The same thing with eating lunch. Uh, if you're taking your mask off, then you have to be six feet apart um, during lunch. So, so that's something that we will uh, be looking, looking at. And then the last thing I'll say before I'd like to invite um, Dr. Frankie to talk is that um, we still are going to need some more guidance from doctors in the Commonwealth about the safe way, if there's any way, to have band and chorus uh, this coming year. So that is still uh, a TBD as we go into, go into the next few weeks. So those are the highlights of today's um, conversation uh, with the commissioner. And um, we, the plan is that we'll be having weekly um, meetings from now on. I, I just don't know which day they will occur. They, they, they have been different days over the last few weeks. So uh, if, if, if this is fine with you, um, Ms. Morgan, I'd like to ask um, uh, see Frankie to, I, let me see if I can see. Um, so there you are, Dr. Frankie. Mm -hmm. Could, Talk, uh, could you talk a little bit about the health um, safety conditions that we've been putting in place and what we continue to expect to do? Okay, so the guidelines came out from the state as to what we're going to need to bring these kids and staff back safely. Um, we're pretty much on target with everything. We've ordered um, quite a bit of PPE. Some has already come in. Uh, such as face shields. Um, we've ordered thousands and thousands of masks, both pediatric and um, actually the PD one just went in today, uh, and adult size, and gloves, um, gowns, lab coats for the clinicians. Um, i trying to think of what else. Gosh, we've ordered so much. Um, in terms of wipes, sanitization wipes, those already came in in the spring. Um, we were really on top of that when everything happened. So we have a decent supply. I'm sure we're gonna need more. Um, just wanna look at my notes real quick here. So we, we're doing really well in terms of the safety guidelines in the nurse's office. One of the things that we don't have, we need clearer guidance on, it has been posited to the commissioner. And that is, we were told that there needs to be an isolation room, which is fair and reasonable. Um, there should be. But then uh, the guidance did state that the room should be separate from the nursing suite. Um, those conditions would be almost unattainable under the current circumstances in most districts because we have, most of our nurses' office have a couple of rooms, albeit they're small, but they're fine for isolation purposes. But one has to be triaged in the main nursing suite and then put into, j just like if you were going to a doctor's office and you're triaged and like sometimes in a small area and then you're brought into an exam room. Similar, we would be able to provide something like that. But if it's going to have to be separate from the nursing suite, 
then who's going to watch the kids when they're in a different area? So that's, as I said, has been posited to the commissioner who um, I believe from what I was told would give us an answer on that at some point soon, I hope. In the meantime, the rooms that are isolation rooms, they are being refitted with new doors so that we, that they're safer. Uh, they have windows in them so that we can see the, the children because I don't, it's not safe to put a child in a room and not be able to see them with the door shut if they're very sick. Um, so that's PPE, that's isolation rooms. Um, teacher and staff training will have to be uh, done. And there's a lot written up on that already, but it's not going to go out yet because I fear that uh, there's gonna be amendments to that before, before we start the school year. But that is in place. Um, let me look at my notes real quick here. Um, there will need to be amendments and uh, policy amendments such are, as related to health and illness. Because right now as it stands, a child only needs to be fever free for 24 hours before returning to school. And um, under the circumstances currently, that's really not reasonable. So in my, my question would be, instead of having to rewrite all the health policies, could we just create an emergency amendment that directs people to CDC and DPH guidelines, which are already in place for the most part. Um, you know, and we could have that information available. So I, I wonder that if we could do that, or do we have to rewrite all the health policies? Um, the research is pretty decent that is coming out saying that children do not um, contract this as easily as adults and do not spread it as easily as adults. Um, I will say though, I do have a little bit of a concern because flu was really bad this year. Prior to us going out after COVID hit, um, we had quite a bit of influenza type A in the district. And given that this particular pathogen is a little bit more virulent, um, I, I do have some concerns about that. So um, the policies and the procedures that we put into place have to be somewhat um, robust and 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 upheld. Um, but I do think that the three foot distancing that the, from a scientific perspective, uh, the three foot distancing is fair and reasonable in the schools. Um, I, does anyone have any questions on what I have given so far? So I think what we'll do is, um, once once you're done, we'll do a round of questions for for you and for Dr. Bodhi. Does that make sense? Dr. Bodhi, did you have more besides this presentation as part of the fall reopening update? Um, the only thing I would add, and, and I and Selmer's not here tonight to talk about it, but just today, uh, special education guidelines were released. So she has said that she would be, she would speak to that at the next meeting. Okay. And Dr. Frankie, were you done? I was, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Great. So, um, Ms. Exton. Um, thank you for the update and thank you, Dr. Frankie, for being here. It's nice to hear from you about some of the things that have been thought about as well. Um, I'm wondering if, there's been any talk about sort of an increase in hand washing stations, just thinking about if classrooms don't have sinks or can you speak a little bit to that, please? Right, right. We did look into, I, I believe it was the director of facilities, um, Jim Feeney. We did talk briefly about portable hand washing stations, especially when kids are coming in and outside of, um, in the fall. Um, at the time, he didn't know that that was reasonable. Um, by the way, I apologize. I have guests and there were children outside my door um, playing. So if you hear any background noise, my apologies. Um, and the other thing, and this may sound a little odd, is keeping bathroom doors open because we don't want kids actually like touching the doors so much. But it's really going to be use of classroom sinks and, um, and bathrooms at this juncture. I, I, there, there are no plans at present that I am aware of that include more hand washing stations than what we have. Um, and this, oh, let me, can I add on to that? 
we have bought a lot of hand sanitizer and stands uh, because at the elementary level, the rooms do have a sink. But at the secondary level, that's not the case. So we're just going to have to rely primarily um, at the, the, the secondary level on hand sanitizing. Yeah. And to add to that, we've already have, the medical orders are already signed and in place for the upcoming year to include use of hand sanitizer. It's actually had to go into the medical orders. Um, we did that before the state gave the guideline, but that was part of the guidelines that came out. Um, I think that's my only... Um, kit. So I, I can ask Dr. Bodie questions too about just the other, other, other non-health and safety things. Um, has, I, has there been um, any thinking about like what this is going to look like in terms of substitutes and you know maybe I'm trying to getting too far ahead but I'm just thinking about sort of funding for that or are people going to want to be substitutes <laughs> like um well the answer is yes we've been thinking about it we're actually more optimistic this year about the possibility of substitutes we have a lot of college students that are going to be at home. Um, we, we know that unfortunately there's a lot of people who may not have their, their positions back in the fall. So I think that there will be a larger pool than we've experienced in the last few years. But there is, we have to make sure that anybody that comes into our school um, go, has the training that is necessary all of the PPE equipment that's necessary and understand what our protocols are. So, you know, unlike maybe past years, while we may have more people, we also have, uh, we have to think about how that will happen. Somebody's coming in, they just simply can't come in without some preparation for being there. Um, go ahead, Th go, thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Cardin? Thank you. Um, so, uh, I guess the first couple comments. Um, so I'm glad we are working to prepare plans that meet the state guidelines and not trying to second guess the guidelines that were endorsed by the Massachusetts chapter of the um, uh, American Association of Pediatrics and uh, also on the national level by the National Association of Pediatrics. Um, I know some of the other districts are. We're not medical experts. The state and the medical associations are, so I'm glad that we are, at least for that plan, um, that they're asking us to prepare following those guidelines. Now, certainly the situation in Massachusetts may change and we may need to be more conservative than three feet, um, but I'm glad that we are uh, at least looking at what a three feet, and planning for what a three feet separation rule will allow us to do, and, and hopefully, if things stay um, uh, low, we can, we can implement that. Um, uh, the other comment is, is also about um, communication. Um, I think, you know, the, the initial guidelines came out two weeks ago, and, and um, I, don't, I don't think there's been a parent communication from the district yet. So I know things are still very early, but, I think at least saying that we are working to develop these three plans. Um, they're due July 31st. We have a lot of work to do. We will be having a, you know, uh, another survey or more opportunities for parent feedback at some point. I don't know if that's going to be in late July or or, or when. Um, but giving giving the community some sense of um, you know what we're doing and why. And, and when there will be a chance for um, community input in a Q&A session. There's, you know, there's lots of questions that are flowing in. You saw some of them in our emails. Um, I know we don't have answers to 99% of those questions, um, but people need to know that at some point they're gonna have a chance to ask questions and get answers. So hopefully we can lay out a, a plan uh, to do that and, and communicate it to parents. Um, I guess my only, um, question at this point 
um, for, for Dr. Franke actually is for protection of teachers, I didn't see anything in the guidelines specifically about that. I know Dr. Bodie mentioned that there should be, um, this wasn't in the guidelines, there should be a six foot, feet, a six foot space for the teachers. But I'm wondering if we're looking at, you know, what, what, what we're looking at to protect our teachers. Our teachers, you know, are we giving our teachers face shields and, 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 and uh, N95 masks or what, how are we going, you know, with, this, with six foot separation, what's our protocol for teachers or is that still evolving? Some of it's still evolving. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting because I, um, you know, I work in the medical community as well. And you know, my colleagues, when, when we see a patient, we wear a mask and we might wear a lab coat and that's our protection for the most part, unless we're in a COVID, um, uh, uh, unit or somewhere where it's higher risk. We're actually going to be protecting the teachers better than we protect some of our own clinicians. So we do have face shields. There was a thousand ordered. Uh, they're reusable. They're anti-fog um, so that they're a little bit more comfortable. So we do have those. Um, we are looking to demo some um, larger masks that are see-through and anti-fog. Um, and we uh, we, are, we have masks for the teachers. We're going to advocate that people have their own. I mean, ours are just sort of the general medical masks. So we have those available too. It is not necessary at this juncture to be wearing gloves unless someone is actually touching children, whether it's a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist or, or special ed, but um, otherwise the hand sanitizer, which someone asked a question of whether that was as efficient as hand washing. No, it's not, but it's still good. Um, so yes, we plan to protect the teachers as best we can. And in, in regard to what their comfort level is, I do think that six feet is fair and reasonable to ask them to do that. Um, but similar to you know reading the paper from Harvard on school reopening, uh, Harvard School of Public Health, you know, it's gonna be a very imperfect situation and we can, we'll do our best. Um, but yes, that is the plan to make sure that the teachers feel comfortable and protected through all of this. And that's actually a great worry of mine too, is I, I want teachers to come back feeling safe, not being nervous about it. Great. Thanks. <laughs> and my, my other question for Dr. Bodhi is I know we're still, you know, the, the tools for, for doing the, the classroom seating arrangements are, have recently been released, but do we have any sense, um, at all yet, um, how, what our capacity is looking at? Or is our typical room going to hold 20 kids? Is it going to hold 24? Are we going to have to, you know, I, I understand we have some rooms that are smaller and those may need to be relocated to cafeterias and gyms and whatever and libraries, but for our average room, what sort of, what is the capacity looking like? Well, my, the preliminary information I have received, let, let's talk about elementary, is that um, it's looking very positive, it's certainly at five of our schools. I haven't gotten the final data from two others that, um, that we probably are going to be able to manage class sizes so that, we, that students can be in the classroom. I, I personally don't like the idea of classrooms being used in the gym um, to, as an all day, because one of the things that is going to be true in the fall is that you're going to have a cohort of students that you are with all day. And you are, we are going to minimize as much as possible, sig significantly limit the intermixing of different cohorts of students. So uh, that's something that I want to have a, a a very comfortable learning environment for students and staff um, as we go into this year. So that's something that we're all talking about and considering in these plans as well. Um, the, at the middle school, we very likely are going to need to hire some more teachers so that we can make sure that the class sizes are such that we, they, they are the number that can be in classrooms. So one of the things that is still not entirely clear is when, if, can, if students can move to another room. At right now, I, I believe that the guidance on that is no. That 
students will stay pretty much in their own classroom unless they go to a place where they can do take their masks off or they go outside for recess. We have to re rethink lunch now with the six foot distance. But um, as a result, we may have extra classrooms that were used for some another subject that we can create another, say another seventh, eighth cluster, not a, like a half seventh, half eighth, and then maybe another half, if not a full cluster at Gibbs. We are looking at that right now. We'll be, we will be making a decision about that very soon. At the high school, it's a, it's a little bit more difficult because you have 1,400 students. So uh, I, I can't really comment on that yet. I, I know they're working very hard to take a look at how they can do it because one of the things that is gonna be true at the high school is we can't really have them in the same cohort all day. It, it's just not gonna work because students, you can, as, at any grade level, you can take a course that a senior might be taking um, and we're not, we're not thinking of restricting choice on um, educationally for students. So that is going to make cohorting an, a challenge. And so we're, we're looking at options on what we could do there. So I can tell you more as we get over the next uh, week or so. Okay, thank you. Dr. Alice Nampi. Thank you. Um, so I guess my first question, so my understanding is that our, the state's R value today ticked up above one, which means we are, I mean, just barely by 1.01, but that means that we're no longer under control. It's starting to grow a teeny bit with each case. Um, I'm, concerned about that happening at this point and then looking, you know, we haven't even full on gone phase three and um, what, thinking ahead to the fall, what I've been wondering is, what I'd really like is kind of an experiment where we put kids under, the, in classrooms under the conditions we're asking everybody to go back to in the fall and see what happens. I understand there's lots of reasons why we can't, I mean, just we put some kids and, and um, see if it, see what the infection rate is and, and things. I understand there's lots of reasons why we can't necessarily do that. But what I'm wondering is, are there any natural experiments happening um, where this situation is being set up for us. So it doesn't have to be in Massachusetts. It could be in other states. Um, and what's, what are the results happening with these? Right now, the best, I, and, and is someone looking for these things and following them and trying to trace down what's happening? Right now, the best ideas that I have are uh, camps. There's a number of summer camps. and. Some of them are not reporting good statistics um, for what's going on. They aren't necessarily following the guidelines to the extent that we are, I mean, that, that are being prescribed, but they also have a lot of time outdoors and stuff. So I'm just wondering who's, who somewhere in this state is gathering data about what's going on, especially with regard to children in a quasi-educational setting and figuring out what's happening in terms of COVID transmission. Well, I could try to answer that a little, uh, a little bit. Um, so I think they're looking actually at other countries such as Denmark um, that have gone back. I know there are certain provinces in China that have gone back and then there are some cities that had to pull back out of school again. Um, so I think my understanding is the Department of Public Health is probably looking quite closely at this. That's my hope. Um, but are they? <laughs> well, that's a, <laughs> so there's, a, uh, 
I would like to think so. I, I would like to think so. Um, I know that Mass General came out with a, a paper with a lot of resources that just came out a few days ago um, and a lot of studies on it. But anything, I mean, this, as, as you know, doctor, this is in its fledgling state in terms of what we have for research. Um, but got, I just, I feel like it's not clear who's got a hold of the problem and who's doing something about it. And also communicating out and listening to questions like mine um, as to what's going on. And the thing about the other countries and stuff is that they're doing a better job of tracing and containing and, and all of that. So it doesn't necessarily relate well to us. I agree so, with that. They live and, a different life. I also wish that there's somewhere that school committees can be asking questions for help. I mean, not, you know, I'm, I'd like to bump it up over your head to the Department of Health or what, I mean, not, not our Department of Health, but the state, because I feel like there's so many things that we're not being told that aren't being communicated. I looked at the Mass General stuff. It's, unless I sit and go through all of the papers, it's not that helpful and it's not clear how closely all these papers apply to our situation. And I'm just, I don't feel like I understand who is really trying hard to do all this. I mean, I, I know that there there's like groups, but I just, I don't feel like it's being well communicated and it, it's just not as clear that there's actually a head and stuff. So, okay, so that's one question. Um, and then another question is, for what I understand, the situation that we're talking about, whether it's as many, whether it's option one or option two, this is going to be a very, very different way of teaching than our teachers usually use. Like very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what, I hope we're already doing, hope we're already doing PD for remote learning and stuff, but it feels to me that this, the option one and option two, when the kids are in school, what are we doing for PD for teachers teaching under these conditions? Because it, it's like the antithesis of what we've been trying to provide to kids. And it's just, I can't even imagine how difficult, I mean, I can imagine it happening, but I can't imagine the kids staying engaged. I can't imagine the kids staying seated, I mean, especially the younger ones. And I, I just, I'm having a hard time with this, so. Well, you're correct um, that this is be a very different teaching style than our teachers have been used to and what we've been encouraging and they have gone to school for and have been practicing for many years. We know that. And I think that, yes, there's going to be required some training. And in fact, one of the things we have to think about too, and it's it's a practical thing, but you know, what are evaluations going to look like this year? Because you know, the things that we have looked for are not necessarily going to be the kind of behaviors you would see in a class in terms of group work. We're not going to have group work. One person in a meeting the other day said it's going to look like 1950 again. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's true. The, so there is certainly a recognition of that. And, but the, uh, the, bottom line value is that regardless it's better for students if we can and it's safe to be in school learning than in a remote option particularly even younger kids because it's so much more difficult we'll talk about the survey in a few minutes in terms of the feedback we've received on this this issue so yes we we understand that um and i think it's going to be helpful to teachers when we finally you know decide this is what we're going to do this is, these are gonna be the parameters in which you have to teach during the day. And then you, it, the uncertainty of it, I think, is something that uh, is a little frustrating 
and for everybody, but it's a process. And the one thing that I said last time, but it's true, is that we, we all have a hard time with uncertainty, but once you can get the final, you can at least start moving toward it. Uh, but even in this situation, once we pick a final a plan to go forward with, it could change. And it could change a couple of weeks into school. There's so many, po uh, so many uh, possibilities here, but yes, you make a very good point and, and that's, that's accurate. That's all. Um, Mr. Thielman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I have a couple questions. Kathy answered uh, actually one of them about <clears throat> intermixing cohorts at the high school um, and the challenge of that. The, I think it was Eisenhower who said that the, the plans are useless, but planning is indispensable um, when you go into battle. And <clears throat> I, I think um, somebody should check the actual quote. <clears throat> Paul can check it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, but uh, so I think that it's important to try uh, to bring students back um, it's, and teachers back. Um, it's important to uh, have the best plans that we possibly can put together. And it's important um, for everyone to understand <clears throat> that we're gonna be pivoting and changing and modifying the plans as we go along, as Kathy just said. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if you read about, and I don't, I, don't mean to make a, a, I don't mean to make a comparison between an ICU unit and a, and a school, but <clears throat> if you look at um, all the COVID precautions that were put in place back in uh, February, March in hospitals, they've now been modified tremendously uh, over the past several months because um, OR heads and ICU heads across the country shared best practices. Um, people in the field uh, found out better ways to do things. Um, and I think there's a value, and I don't, want, I don't want to experiment with kids, but I think there's a value in um, trying something, being as careful and cautious as we have, having a plan, having everybody understand the plan will be modified and changed as we move along, and then having educators uh, gather and share what they've experienced. Well, we did this this day, we did, I can teach without the mask, I can't teach without the mask. Um, <clears throat> I'm able to keep the fourth graders mask on for so many hours, but not more than 45 minutes at a time, or more than 38 minutes at a time, I don't know. But over time, we've got to try these things, and we've got to be willing to modify, and you know, um, I think we have. I, ha I think we have to be able to live with that, and we have to expect the district will do the very best it can to create a plan that will be followed, understanding that it will be modified, and there has to be built into the program. That it has to be built into into the practice of the teachers, and there has to be time for this, um, for a sharing of best practices, time to give feedback, time to uh, talk about what educators have learned about how to do this model. So that's I'm going to preface it by that, uh, by saying that. Um, the, um, I guess I heard, am I to understand that in all likelihood we will not have gym classes in the fall? Um, or that's not clarified yet? Um, no, I don't think that that, that would be a conclusion you would okay. necessarily have. Um, there could be classes outside. Of course, that's limited to good weather. Yeah. If they're in the gym. They have to and doing any kind of activity. And, and we're gonna to have to limit the kinds of activities, just like there's going to potentially be a limit on what types of sports can be played. Currently this summer, some sports are okay, some are not. Um, you can have practices with ice hockey, but you can't have games. Yeah. You can have tennis, but you, you can't have basketball. Those kinds of things, it depends on the contact, it depends on the potential for, for you know, a particle projection. So it could be that gym would be a little bit, the PE would be a little bit different um, this year. And that's going to take some planning as well. But no, we, I, I think that at all levels, our students want to participate in something, but it, but some things won't be as possible. Okay. My, my other question is, um, or maybe this is for Sue or, you know, like what's the thinking been or the conversation's been about what happens if a child or a teacher contracts COVID. How is that? Like what what are the op, what are the options? I mean, because if 
Does it mean, yes, yeah, so Jeff, I'm just curious to know. No, no, it's a good question. And so it, it's a tight protocol. It'll probably be very similar to what we've done before, although with the research, it might be modified a bit, a little bit. So it, it, it depends which building it is, you know, elementary versus high school, of course. Yeah. But um, if a child, let's say, gets a positive diagnosis, mm -hmm. then we're looking at, you know, having those kids quarant possibly quarantine for two weeks as well as the teacher or teachers. I'm not sure that the protocol that the Board of Health put out or the DPH put out will be changed that much in relation to quarantining um, and isolation. Um, and then it's cleaning the classrooms. Anything on a larger scale in terms of the building, I, I, I can't speak on that at this point, um, but it's gonna be very similar protocols. There's also self-certification protocols in, in place now for summer, uh, and there will be both for students and for teachers, and you know, saying, I don't have a fever, I haven't been around anyone with COVID, I don't have any symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. So those things are already in place and they'll be tweaked a little bit more, but they're, they're pretty robust now. Um, so yeah, it, it, it'll be pretty similar. And do you, I mean, so the, and I, and I get how it can work <clears throat> at an elementary school. You know, we did it already with one of the schools. And um, so we kind of, I understand that. The question is at the high school. Um, when you have, I mean, if you have a student who is uh, in multiple classes, multiple levels, interfacing with students all over the building, I, I just, I'm just curious. I mean, I'm, I, what's the thinking been so far? Well, the, 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 actually the commissioner addressed that a little bit today no. by just simply saying you're going to get more guidelines in August because it's, in, as you said, it's evolving and, and, and it probably will even once we're back in school as well. So yes, they're planning to give us that information um, and we'll follow those protocols, but you're right, high school presents a challenging situation if we're going to allow kids to take the courses that they've chosen. And that's the plan currently. Um, but yes, that, that is an issue of how we do the contact tracing and, and when we're talking about such a large number of students, what, what the consequences would be. Uh, <clears throat> my last question relates to the high school as well. W would you consider reducing the number of electives and course offerings is that something you would that happen is that a, is that on the is that, that, a is, that actually is going to happen somewhat um already there's a there's been a practice in many courses in every department that you can choose which way if you want to take it for honors level or you want to take it for curriculum a level and you sign an, an agreement as to the work that you would do to get the honors level. So I think that we'll see a little bit more collapsing of that exactly in that way, just uh, again, a little bit more minimizing. I'm not sure it's gonna happen in every course, but um, I think it depends on the numbers that, again, it's, a, it, it's the high school schedule and the sections are determined by student choices. So it may not be practical to collapse it that way, but yes, that kind of thinking is going on. And then final question, I'm sorry, Jane, I don't know why I said this. Last question, uh, <clears throat> you're, if I wanna make sure I understand uh, Jeff Riley's, the commissioner's position, and that is that it is possible to have um, parallel remote instruction taking place. So some parents could opt for parallel remote instruction while other children, while other uh, parents opt to have their kids in school. That's correct. Okay, so he's now in favor of that. Yes, I think, that the number of students that might have fragile, fragile conditions themselves or in their family, the reality of that is that we have to be able to provide an education for those students. As I said, the state may go to a learning management service that we could do a subscription for, but uh, I think collectively in our district, we would like to do our own. Okay, because some parents may just offer that option, but it may, it may not be for health reasons. It may be just for, because they don't want to, uncertainty and unco being uncomfortable with the protocols that are in place. And they, so that may happen. Would you, there's, so there's limited enforceability. If somebody says, <clears throat> or you're gonna. I, yeah, I, I think that, that that will be, 
that will be very difficult to determine unless we require some kind of um, yeah. doctor's agreement, but I'm, doctor's note, but um, we haven't gotten that far yet. I think today we've been thinking about this uh, as an option. And in fact, we can talk about the survey results and we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to resurvey people once once we know what we think the plan is, we have to then resurvey and see where people stand. Because I think it's important for, for, for the parents to know this. But I think absent, this is what we're planning in the fall. I, I'm not, I, I think this is not gonna work for my family. I will say that right now, what we are doing in district is trying to develop a plan where as many students and it can come back to school in the fall. Um, we are we, we're developing a hybrid plan, but our efforts are really more toward the students coming back. Um, at this point, we will also have a remote plan, but I don't, I don't see necessarily, it could happen, um, that we would have to delay the start of school and everybody and be in a remote situation. It's just hard to know. I think the more likely possibility is that we start and we have to go into remote. We need to be prepared. And that's one of the reasons why um, I think the remote option is a good option because we are going to have a really strong coherency between our classrooms in the district and the remote. And the room, remote's not going to be like the remote we had last year. It's going to be much more synchronous. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. Did we lose Jane? We did. So we I get promoted for I yeah. get promoted for a couple of seconds. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Okay. First of all, as a point of order, we've got somebody using the Q and A or the chat feature, uh, and I just want to emphasize to people who are attendees that this meeting is subject to the open meeting law, so we can't go there, look at it, or respond to. Uh, chats or questions uh, that are coming in electronically outside the meeting. Um, th this is, I, I look, um, first of all, we do know that there are going to be school districts in the United States that are opening sometime in, in August. So we should have some kind of data available to us from what's happening elsewhere in the, uh, in, in the nation. Although the problem that I'm seeing right now is this has become so politicized that it's tough to trust anyone's data because you've got folks who are either absolutely dedicated to opening school under, no cir uh, under any circumstance, and then some folks who think that we should just keep it closed until we have a, a vaccine. and. Uh, I, I want to make a scientifically based decision and not a a, a a political one. And it's difficult if we don't have a reliable source of information about what's going on. It's particularly disturbing to see the, the huge spike in cases elsewhere in the nation. Uh, and because we do have the capacity to move around the United States, this could be back here uh, without us knowing it for a couple of weeks as, as we're starting school. So I'm, I'm very, very anxious and nervous about how we move forward. Uh, Dr. Bodhi, first of all, you said we're going to get a video from the medical community. Who, who is this medical community and, uh, and what should we be anticipating? Um, I don't have a lot of details on that. I think it's from the Pediatric Association, maybe from researchers. I, I don't know. We just know basically what I told you. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, I've seen an email, people who uh, might opt to not register for school and uh, withdraw for homeschooling for the year. And I would urge people uh, not to do that. Um, and, and I hope that we as a district would put out that kind of a message. As our enrollment in the 2020-21 school year, particularly on October 1, is the defining factor for our Chapter 78 in the 2021-22 school year. And if we have a drop-off in students this year, we will have a drop-off in funding for next year. And that I think the message that we need to send out 
uh, and, and send it out strong is that we will be there and support students in uh, regardless of whether or not they feel safe coming into the buildings in, in September and we need them to register we need them to participate with us and we we want to be there together as a community um, my next question is definitely in terms of funding we, we are spending a lot of money on uh, modifications and supplies uh, where do we stand in terms of that element of the funding, notwithstanding the uh, Chapter 70 money that has not been determined uh, up to this point? Where do we stand with respect to the budget to fund the, the extra costs we incur? Is that, is that your question? Yeah, basically, how are we paying for this stuff for all the ex uh, ex extra things that we need to buy and do? And how much of this is being reimbursed and, and how much of this is being a burden right now? I'm going to put Mr. Mason on the spot in a second, but let me just say um, that that the money that comes in through the COVID uh, mm -hmm. that we have submitted, we submitted an, um, documented evidence in June, and there's another there's another opportunity in August. A lot of the um, technology <laughs> that we bought and mm -hmm. some of this PPE that we're buying. Uh, can be funded through that. Now that money, however, cannot be used for any kind of salaries. Mm -hmm. So I would, uh, let, let me make a pause here is because this is a going to be an ongoing problem and this is going to be something updated on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be a big report or one pager of how much extra we're spending, what we anticipate spending, how much we have applied for and how much we've received a very simple one pager for every meeting of sort of a COVID financial report would be very helpful because I think that we really need to keep track of this because what's obvious is, is we've got federal and state officials telling us that we need to reopen, but they're not putting the money behind it. Uh, and until we have a commitment of full funding, uh, I, I think that we've got to push back on, on, on mandates as well. Um, one one glimmer uh, with that I think is very positive with respect to this is that the money that was that came through COVID, as I said, were really for things. But the money that is coming now from that one hundred ninety three million dollars, which will be pretty much, I wouldn't say it's entitlement, but we're going to be applying for it. The, the template will come out next week. Um, is, is about two hundred twenty five dollars per student. So for Arlington, it's a little over one point three million that kind of money can be used for um, salaries. So we can do that uh, is to provide that information. In fact, we, we have it because we have to submit that information as part of a reimbursement plan. Um, Mr. Mason, do you want to say something uh, more about that? Um, yeah, I can uh, briefly add on. I think you covered a, a good portion of it, but um, yeah, the, the funds that, are, that will come in for the grant um, will definitely be, can be used for more than the flexibility that we had with the CARES funding that we had the deadline in FY, with FY20 expenditures. So many of the expenditures that you've, we've talked about already, um, that's including the PPE supplies, all of the um, uh, remote learning and computer purchases that were been required up to this point, and, even the software that we're using right now to host this meeting um, has been covered uh, under a COVID submission um, and COVID funds that will be reimbursed to the town. Um, and most of those expenditures will come off of the current uh, expended, uh, budget that we did last year as a return back to the town. Um, going forward, we, we do have some additional funds from Esther, that's going to be used for planning and other things, but mainly this is uh, the, the expenditures, expenditures going forward. Uh, we'll be able to then be applied again for similar mm -hmm. funding that we did at the end of last year or a couple couple of weeks ago, shall I say. And mm -hmm. um, that should be able to hopefully cover a decent portion of the expenditures that we are incurring, that we will incur. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying this is also a moving target and rather than getting an oral report, because 
I'm going to ask this question in every meeting we have. Mm -hmm. But rather than getting an oral report and having to go and figure out and take notes, and I'd, I'd like a one pager that basically says what category of funding might we get, what have we applied for, what do you, we, th we think we're going to get, just so we know what the status is. Uh, I, I think it's important because we're going to be asked to make policy decisions down the road, and a lot of the policy decisions are going to be based on how much money we have uh, and what we can afford to do. And so having this information in our hands as we go through meetings is, is really an important, important part of, of what we're doing. Uh, the other question, I have a question and a statement. I'll get the statement out of the way, then I'll ask the question so I can mute myself. Uh, the statement is, I also hope we are not eliminating at, uh, um, electives at the high school because those are the kind of courses that we can even more effectively do in, in a hybrid or remote faction. I do not want to lose programming. Uh, and if it requires uh, adjustments in the way we deliver in order to make sure the uh, programming is offered, I want to do that rather than trying to be in some sort of an orthodoxy in terms of, uh, of, of how we're delivering an accounting to the state. And the other question is, um, when this whole thing broke, it was pretty obvious, although we didn't have the data in front of us. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not on the Board of Health. But it's obvious that the fact that we had the Biogen Conference is an entry point for COVID into the region. We have Biogen employees in, in Arlington, and we started to see cases before we closed. The, I, I understand that the number of cases and the experiences we were having in town was an important part of the superintendent's decision to align with other superintendent, neighboring superintendents to close down before the governor uh, moved on the issue. I, I think the people I would trust the most are the local Arlington Board of Health, Arlington Health officials in concert with health officials in surrounding towns so we know exactly where we stand in our community uh, with regard to the virus. Um, and I hope that without breaking any kind of confidentiality that when we are asked to make decisions uh, that we'll be doing it uh, in a data informed basis. And that's sort of where I'm going to leave it with the question of, you know, how are we tracking things and communicating with the local board of health? Um, I meet every day with the uh, board of health and um, Arlington leadership. We have a standing meeting, and uh, we we talk about all of the the cases that are coming through. That that is tracked on the state system. And uh, our Arlington Board of Health, people should be very reassured what a competent group of people these, these are. They do contact tracing um, for, this, for the cases. When, when, someone, when someone tests positive for COVID, that gets reported to the state that goes on the, the state uh, system. So they are very much aware. Now, are there people that have COVID that are not getting tested? Yes. But, and so those people would not be on uh, the state system. But right now, Arlington has pretty, pretty much flat. And in fact, on the town website, they keep, a run, they keep all of that data there for everybody to see. But we do, in fact, you know, I bring up questions uh, that, that we need to answer. And they're, they're very much going to be uh, part of the consulting team as we go through our, our process over the next well, this is going to go on for months, not just the next six weeks. Yeah, I, I really have a lot of faith in the Arlington Health Board of Health and, and the folks who work on the town side. Uh, and I probably have more faith in them than any other source that I could take a look at right now. Uh, it's just also important that we are communicated with where appropriate because people ask us questions as well. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to ask Ms. Morgan to please stay here. You caused palpitations running away. I wasn't prepared. 
I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bodie and the entire staff for uh, the phenomenal job you're doing, Dr. Frankie, especially um, during these strange conditions. I had a couple of requests. Uh, most of my questions got answered by uh, earlier. I'd like to request uh, at least a rough draft of what you're going to be, be presenting to the state for the next school committee meeting ahead of time for us to just take a, a, a look at it, what's going forward. It doesn't have to be the final, just a rough draft. And um, I correct me if I'm wrong, did I hear you say that the state has set out uh, preliminary guidelines for special education, Dr. Bodhi? Uh, the not, the, they sent them out today. I haven't had a chance to look at them, but, they, but they'll also be on the Jesse website. I can, um, I can send you the link. Would you send us the link and uh, just put it on the school committee because I've had a lot of parents asking that and I think it'll uh, allay a lot of fears or take care of a lot of questions ahead of time. Thank you. That's it for me. Um, so I had just one comment and um, I'm glad that Ms. Peretz is here because she can um, potentially relay my comments directly to the uh, principal team. I you know, uh, that the piece that makes me the most nervous about return to school is that some of the experiences and some of the stumbling blocks that I've had, especially in um, our elementary schools around getting kids out to recess and hand washing and how they just can't wash their hands before they go to lunch and a lot of things that have been really like rigid and very difficult to work with and have required just extraordinary parent outrage, anger, upset, advocacy, and have taken a really long time to sort of turn the corner on um, are things that we're really going to need to be responsive to when we go back to school in this kind of an environment. And given the experience that I've had in elementary school with my kids, um, I, uh, I am not totally confident about that. I don't, I don't feel great about it because, you know, it's, it's, it's real reasonable to have a six-year-old wash their hands before they eat lunch. Like, it, it's just, it is not an unreasonable thing to do. And, and we've always been told, oh, well, it's just not possible and you just can't get the kids through or they don't do a good job or da 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 and, um, and, and I guess I've heard, I mean, I've had a kid in elementary school for like nine years maybe, long time, um, and I've heard the same tune, oh, well, recess, it's hard, they can't get their shoes on, or oh, if there's a little bit of rain, and all this kind of carry on, and um, I, I just really feel like this, this is the year where I'm hoping we're going to turn the corner on some of that, um, because it seems like it's so important, if, if being outside, we know is the safest, you know, is one of the safest places for kids to be, we really need to prioritize that, I'm really, really hoping that um, that it's going to be a different experience. I I like we've got to have kids washing their hands before lunch. Hand sanitizer is like it's. I guess we got to use it maybe when they come in in the morning, etc. But like we've got to get kids washing their hands, and and uh, I really think it's something that if we train them to do it, it's you know they're they're going to be able to get through those lines. And I I hope that we can just hit. Uh, you know, hit the ground running on some of those things so that these don't become like protracted battles, especially at the elementary school level. And, and we've certainly experienced that. I have for many years. So um, the other piece, um, the other question, Dr. Bodhi, I guess for you, and I appreciating that I, I don't think that there's an answer to this at this point, but um, I guess it's feedback from the community. I get a lot of questions about after school, right? Understandably, um, whether or not after school. So I guess Maybe the question that you might know the answer to is whether or not after school programs, be them um, the Arlington School Program or private programs that are using our buildings, are they required to adhere to the same guidelines that DESE has put out or do we not know or no? They absolutely are going to be subject to the same guidelines and I've already begun um, talking with our, our Director of After School Programming, Todd Morris, they have a lot of planning because it means rethinking what after school is going to be like. Um, again, we going back to that, uh, the idea of a cohort and the question of how much movement there is going to be, be possible. But I think that the other issue is, um, 
you know, the, the students are going to have to be in classrooms more than, more than likely. And so we are going to have to get protocols for cleaning classrooms um, so that the students that come back the next day have a, a, a room that has been sanitized. So there's a lot of planning that needs to go on that. But I, I think that parents um, would like to have the after school program continue. And that is certainly what we are working toward doing and working with them uh, what those guidelines will be. So right now, uh, Mr. Morris is part of our steering committee and he is privy to all we're talking about. We will be giving guidelines to the the private after school programs that they must adhere to. Great, thank you. And I think a recognition that potentially um, some of our, you know, that, that we could see differences, but we, we have always had differences between our privately run programs and those programs that have been part of the, you know, the district run Arlington after school program. Um, you know, I, I, it's definitely something that I'm worried about. I don't know if some of our private programs, um, you know, financial structure is going to support them being able to adhere to the guidelines that I fully support. We, we hold them to. Right. And so, um, that's definitely, you know, I think that's, it's definitely a concern. Um, and, and I think, you know, after school is, is really important. Um, and, uh, but it, it's a different, it's, it, you know, it's different than the school day, right? So. It uh, won't be an option. It, pardon? Not, it will not be an option. It will not be an option to not follow the guidance. Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, okay. So um, the next, so that's that's it for reopening. Was there anything that we missed as we went through? I, I will give you a, a list of these uh, these highlights. But uh, uh, to Mr. Cardin's earlier comment, yes, we've been talking about we need to get weekly communications going uh, out to parents. Um, it's just been not known where we were actually heading, but definitely that is the direction we're going. And as I said, once we have a plan, we're going to have to resurvey parents. And then there will have to be a period of time where we have some kind of um, definitive, survey is one thing, then a definitive choice. So we will, it's not really a choice. It's, it's really has, we'll have conditions with it in terms of, um, we know that we know medical fragility or riskiness is an issue. Thank you. Um, so the next um, item is the parent survey results, Dr. McDeal and Dr. Bodie. And actually, before we start, I want to thank um, Dr. McNeil and Ms. Fitzgerald for providing us with the, um, it, the information from the survey. I, I think it was as early as it was yesterday, maybe yesterday morning. Um, felt like a long time, which was great. Um, really helpful to be able to see that and click through it. Um, and it was really helpful for me in um, being able to see it. And then I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much. Well, we're going to do this together, but I'm going to let uh, Dr. Neil start. And I want to thank him too, uh, in terms of all the work that he's done on, on the survey and looking at all the responses. I'll let him talk a little bit about that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Uh, I'm going to, do I have the permissions to share my screen so that we can display the dashboard? I'll go ahead and try. I think I do. I do. So please let me know if you see my, you're able to see my screen. Can everybody good. see? Yeah, okay. I can see it. Perfect. So yes, uh, thank you um, for that compliment, Ms. Morgan. Uh, it, it, it was actually, you know, I really in, actually enjoyed uh, going through the survey because it gave me an opportunity to really understand uh, what parents were thinking and, you know, their experiences as it, as it related to this last spring. Um, and then being able to see, you know, some of the things that they're thinking about as we move forward uh, with fall planning. Um, I will go over the different parts of the survey and then I'm, I'm just going to focus on various questions that um, had to deal with the curriculum and instruction and, you know, 
exactly what I just said about parents is parents and their experience uh, with the remote learning plan that we had in place over the spring. Uh, but so right up here at the top of the survey, you can see the, the percentage. And if you hover, you know, as I hover my cursor over each one of the pie slices, you can see the percentage as well as the actual number, uh, you know, that divides up, you know, the parents who responded to the survey. So you can see, you know, the proportionality of, of you know, who was responding. And so on the left hand side, you'll see the schools and on the right hand side, you'll see the grades. So we had, you know, the actual prompts and questions are right here, and you can see how the peop the different respondents uh, replied. Uh, so I'm just going to jump down here to um, minimize this over here. I'm going to jump down here to some of the questions that related, ex you know, to the experiences that parents had over the spring. So um, the things that I focused on and what I wanted to highlight for the meeting here. Uh, was looking at the actual um, instruction, if you will. So different questions and prompts that, you know, had to deal with that. For instance, here, the work my child has been getting through remote learning is manageable for me as a parent to support. And so as I looked at this question and I saw, you know, the number of people who answered yes and no, I also disaggregated the data to see, you know, what grades are represented here and how they responded and what is the percentage. So it was the lower grades. Um, actually, I was, I was quite um, you know, pleased with the answer to this question because uh, you know, we had the majority of the people said, yes, the um, work was manageable. However, I was concerned about the percentage of individuals that said no. Um, so I disaggregated that data and the majority of the people who, who answered no had students that were in the earlier grades. And I can understand that because that also correlated with the open responses where parents were sharing their experience and saying that, you know, they had to support their students in kindergarten, first and second grade because of the way that the remote learning plan was uh, set up. And so we were using the grids to push out content and the Google Classroom. So they were saying that definitely it was very difficult balancing their work life with also having the um, increased responsibility for their students' educational development. So I can understand that. Um, and then going over here, looking at uh, how many hours a day, I was looking at that and you know, looking at the majority of the people answered one to two hours. Uh, so we had a certain percentage of individuals that were saying that they had three and a half hours or more. And, uh, and, and our target was to have at least three hours of instruction every, you know, learning activities every day that the students would be engaged in. So I know that we need to do some work here um, and I understand that. Um, so looking, moving along, um, you know, looking at the other prompts uh, and looking at whether or not children were able to complete their work without help from an adult or a family member. Again, you know, I was looking at the responses and I was just definitely concerned about the people who, who answered no, never, um, and we had quite a few of them. And then we were trending, you know, lower here at some times to never. So I was, I disaggregated the data once again, and, you know, definitely looking at the percentage of individuals we were trending, uh, those parents were trending who had kids at the lower grades. So the trend was uh, the parents at the lower grades were feeling more of the frustration, as you could probably imagine, because they had to support their students. Um, and then looking over here, and then, so we're gonna go to the next page, uh, and then we're gonna look at some questions and prompts there. Again, you have the, the pie charts here at the top, uh, and then as you scroll down, I was also looking at over here where we were looking at um, how parents responded to whether or not they had a positive experience with the remote learning plan. And again, we were trending towards disagree and slightly agree. I disaggregate the data for the disagree. And again, we're looking at the parents um, who were trending, who had kids at the lower, eight, lower grades. So I know that the brunt of the responsibility for maintaining the educational plan, you know, you know, with parents at the lower grades, it was, you know, very difficult. 
Um, and I also- Dr. McNeil, can I just interrupt you just for a point of clarification as we're talking about this so that we all understand? Um, there yes. are a lot of responses that are like always, comma, often, always, comma, never. There was yes. one person. Can you just, just, I, I'm so distracted by those. I just, could you, do you know what that means? Yes, I do. So there okay. was a flaw that, you know, as, as always, you look for the certain flaws in surveys. So on this particular survey, we used a Google form to collect the information. And uh, I knew going into it, it was going to be a, a problem because we had utilized this on a previous survey. So parents were th the main questions, the main, uh, I guess, check boxes that they were supposed to select were uh, for some of these. And I will go up here, for instance, from, on, on this question right here, my child's teachers have been supportive with helping my child complete their assignments. They were supposed to select always, often, sometimes, or never. So sometimes you know, when people were selecting the different check boxes on this particular prompt, on these type of prompts, they were selecting two. So I don't know if they were thinking about for some, for some of my children, I have to provide some support, but then some of other children that I have in the same household, um, I'm sorry, some of my children are receiving very, you know, great support or, or getting support from their teachers. And then some of my children are not getting any support from their children, I mean, for their children. So that's what I'm thinking is how they, you know, um, interpreted this question and how to respond. That is something I have to think about how we can solve that moving forward so that we can get more clean data. Um, but you are looking at raw data and I want it to be transparent. That is why I kept it in, in here. So, you know, I didn't want to clean it up because I didn't want to give the impression that I was trying to somehow make, you know, make the survey bias towards a certain way. So I no, left totally, it in. I totally appreciate that. I just want to make sure we all understand it. The other one, the other piece that I don't understand is the last line. Yes. Doesn't have, okay. So this line, uh, thank you for these questions. Very good questions. These are the, so not everyone answered every question. So the last line where you have nothing there, these are people that just did not respond to this question. So if you add up all the individuals who, who responded and selected something, so we had 2,782 responses to the survey. If you subtract the 95 people here, you'll get the number of people who actually respond, gave a response. These are the individuals that did not respond. And you can see at the bottom, the line at the, at the bottom on some of the prompts, it varies. So not everybody responded to every prompt. Perfect, got it. I'm with you now. Thank you so much, carry on. No worries. So again, looking at this, question about you know how supportive were teachers doing the remote learning plan you know I was definitely concerned about you know looking at never and looking at sometimes so I disaggregate the data and in order to determine you know what population of parents were selecting that so again looking at the lower uh, elementary you know parents who had kids in the lower elementary grades they tended to you know the, the data tended to skew to never sometimes and so I, I i think you know i'm feeling their frustration and i understand where they're coming from with that so that those are different points that we are going to focus on as we move forward and then um i don't want to run on too long but i also looked at the questions down here and just again went through really you know try to understand what the parents were telling me through the survey um and just looking over here you know, looking at um, whether or not the child's remote learning experience was positive, you know, looking at the flexibility of the different assignments that we were, or the, the videos that we were offering, like, you know, asynchronous versus synchronous. And then, you know, looking at the quality of instruction. Again, parents were, you know, at, with the kids who had, who had kids in lower grades tended to not really feel that they were getting, uh, the, the instructional quality wasn't where we wanted it to be. And then looking at engagement, that is something else that I was really focusing on to make sure that I was really understanding where we need to really focus our efforts and definitely looking at trying to make the remote learning experience and assignments more engaging. I know that is something that we need to focus on. So I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to go on.
Um, I, they, I did go through the open responses, but I'm gonna allow, uh, you know, ask Dr. Bodie if she wants to interject anything right here, and then I can, I can talk about the open responses moving forward a little as we, as we go through the survey a little bit more. I don't know if people want to ask questions about this part because the survey was in two parts. It was the experience from May 4th uh, through the end of the school year, and then we looked at, looked ahead at planning for the fall. Um, do you want let's to just do let's do the whole let's do all of your pieces, and then um, we can do questions on on both parts. I think makes the most sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, do you want me to finish with the open responses? I can just finish there. I just. I just want to say that I understand what I got from the survey about the quality of instruction, engagement, looking, it, it, we tended to trend, like I said before, the, the parents who had kids in the lower grades, they were the ones that were, that were answering in a more negative fashion about their experience. And so that is something that I, I, I am understanding and I know that that's something we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Dr. Bodie, do you want me to talk about the open responses or do you want to talk about the fall planning? Um, well, you could talk a little bit about the open responses. The, the, just the, the number, we had well over 2,000 responses. Okay. Did so you, you uh, organizing in groups. Right. So I will go through the, and so what I want to, I want everyone to understand like the different sections of the survey. So this is page two. We couldn't fit all the prompts and questions onto one page. Then again, as you, put, as you go, as you advance, you can click up here on the arrow and you can advance to the different pages on the dashboard. The last page is where we had our open responses. And so this is where I spent a lot of, you know, a lot of my time uh, trying to understand what parents were trying to tell us and communicate to us. So we had 2,187 open responses. Yes, I read every last one of them. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to understand what the themes were. So, and I'm glad that I did that. So I, I looked for themes and I coded the responses. So I just want to go through the codes right here. If a, a response was, you know, emphasizing the need for childcare in the fall, I labeled it, I put it under childcare. If parents want us to have kind of like a a la carte and different models that they can choose from, different plans that they can choose from that best fits their situation, I coded it as choice. If it was a comment that really didn't have a focus, I put, just put comments like miscellaneous so I could go back and read. And then I made notes, on, I, I, I uh, wrote notes on those comments as well. If we got a compliment and people were satisfied with their spring learning, I mean, remote learning experience, I labeled it as compliment. If parents were saying like, I don't care what plan you use, but just make sure it's a consistent plan that stays the same throughout the year. I labeled it as consistent plan. If parents emphasize, you know what, we want to have a full-time schedule, kids back in school, I labeled it as full-time school. If parents stress the health and safety of their children and staff and of the adults over everything else, I labeled it as health and safety. If parents wanted a hybrid model and they said, that's, the, that's what we want, I labeled it as hybrid. I labeled it as remote learning not effective. And those are the parents that said, you know what? The experience that we had over the spring was not effective. My kids didn't get anything out of it. This is where we need to focus our attention. If parents labeled it, I mean, if parents uh, had a theme in their response where we were talking about, we want to have a remote learning option and nothing else, then I, 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 I labeled it as remote learning option. And if parents stressed the SEL, they want us to really focus on providing their kids with, you know, the, the thing that they missed the most was about the peer inter interaction. And it was like really having a negative effect on their the social emotional well-being of their children. I labeled it as a SEL. And then parents that were saying, you know what, we're okay with a hybrid plan or remote learning option. And if you do that, we need to have more structured classes and we need to have more synchronized instruction from the teachers. So you can see what the percentage is and the actual numbers of to the responses. And I will, do a, I will give a caveat, like this is based upon, as any researcher will tell you, there's some bias there, I'm sure. Somebody might look at a response and label it a different way. So I definitely want to put that out there. And as, and as you, as anybody's done any type of research and you, you had to code it various uh, responses and through a qualitative uh, you know, research survey, 
you know that that is one of the limitations that there is the bias of the researcher. So I will, you know, um, admit to that, but this is where uh, I landed with the different codes. I didn't want to have too many codes, but I definitely wanted to make sure I got the essence of what everybody was trying to tell us. So I'll stop right there. So could you move it down to the uh, fall planning? Yes, I will go back to those pages, yes. So here we'll, we'll have on, on page two of the dashboard, you'll see the, where the questions begin about fall planning. Mm -hmm. One of the things we were very interested in learning, of course, as we moving forward, as we were talking earlier this evening is, you know, where are parents in terms of what their thinking is right now uh, for the fall? So the first, can you just move it down a little bit so we can see that question? There we go. Is it How's that? More? Um, mm -mm. Am I going the wrong way? Yeah, you're going, uh, I think, the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually right there. It begins with, okay. Right. So, if the Arlington schools begin with a regular schedule in the fall, I'm likely to send my child to school. So, in that, in that scenario, just looking at the strongly or agree or agree, uh, we're looking at um, about 76% of our, of our families are saying that. Now, that's in a very abstraction without even knowing what the plan would, would what the safety precautions would be or, or what the plan would be. Um, when you look at a hybrid, interestingly, that number was a little bit higher, about 80% of the strongly agree and they agree. Um, are you concerned about childcare if we open with a remote or hybrid schedule? And nearly half, about 45%, said they agree or strongly agree. I did not take into consideration the multiple answers that people may have given. Um, interestingly, the next, another question about whether you think that your child has enough space, uh, for social distancing, just slightly over 50%, 53% thought that strongly agreed or agreed that schools would have this. Um, would student, there's one thing to have the distancing and the other is Will do you think students would actually uh, maintain the safety protocols of social distancing, avoiding physical contact? And about only 28%, under 30% thought that they strongly agreed or agreed on that. So that, that's something that we certainly are going to have to be working on with our students and training them in the protocols that they have to um, abide by for everybody's safety. So one of the other questions we wanted to take a look at was the question if we offered a remote, I think we need to go, if we offered a remote um, option because there was a, a riskiness with the child's medical condition or just, you know, there was riskiness that would uh, be a problem in their family. What we found is that um, in terms of likely or very likely, um, that they would choose it, uh, about 27% would choose it with alternating days. About 25% didn't really change whether it was alternating weeks. And then if you compare it to whether they would choose a remote if it was a regular school day, uh, the, the percentage jumped up to about 33%. So we have somewhere a of the quarter of the families that, that took this survey, um, are, would be very interested in a remote option should that be um, offered to them. The thing is, this was represented about 2,800 uh, respondents. The survey went out to 6,800 email addresses. So we had a, a little over 40%, 41% uh, return rate, which is actually very good uh, for surveys. So as I said, we're going to have to do this again as we uh, we have a more firm plan just to get uh, a, a, 
better sense of where families are going to be. But that's, that's the result. And we were able, as, as Dr. McNeil was talking about, actually dig very deeply into this by grade level in school, uh, just to get a better sense of where people stand on this. And that, th those are the highlights of the survey. Does anyone have any questions about this or comments? Um, Ms. Exton. Um, thank you for um, the survey and for all of the sharing all of it and in detail. Um, I have two questions. One, and maybe you mentioned this and I missed it. Um, when you separated out the comments, Dr. McNeil, could, were you able, like some comments might have been about more than one thing. Did you, you could divvy them into those. I was trying to do the math of the comments and how many responded, or was it a comment went to one um, topic? Oh, so that's a very good question. So, uh, yes, yeah, so it was a one-to-one -one correlation. So as I had the codes, I just, I read a response and I said, where does this fall under these codes? And you have to actually read the comments over more than one time, to be honest with you, really to understand and be, you know, very secure, like, okay, I read that correctly. And then this is going to be coded this way. So it was like, you know, there was, if you go, I'll go back and share the screen. Uh, so you can see the survey. So you'll be able to see. <clears throat> the number over here. So you'll right. see on the right hand side, you'll see health and safety. So there were 480 comments that prioritize the health and safety of the parents and students. And let me just give you the essence of that. They were saying, whatever you decide, please use the science in order to lead your decision. Don't worry about anything else. We want you to worry about the health and safety of the adults and the children and let that be the priority as you make your decisions. So I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, um if they said something about health and safety, but then they also said something about they were worried about social and emotional learning. Mm -hmm. Did you, did health and safety get a tick box and social emotional learning? Or are you kind of? No, wait? that's a very good question. Okay. I tried to keep it as clean as possible. And okay. so I, yes, and that's a very good point. So when they had like, I could not determine where they were emphasizing something or they were making an emphasis, or I couldn't determine the theme, that's when I just labeled it as a comment. Okay. You know what I mean? So if, so if they were saying, we want you to do this, you know, we want you to consider health and safety, but we also want our kids to be back in school, but we also want you to have synchronous instruction. If they had like multiple things that they were emphasizing, I, 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 termed, I, um, I uh, labeled it as a comment. And then I made notes on the side of that to understand what is, the mo what is the thing that's trending through all these various comments? And what, is the things, what are the things that people are really emphasizing? And so some of the things that they're really emphasizing is that we want to take into, they want us to take in consideration that we have working parents in Arlington and we need to understand that having them take on a huge responsibility as moving their kids forward in the curriculum is going to impact their ability to provide for their families. So we need the more structure. So they were just, you know, making sure that we understood that these are the things that you want, we want you to consider. I don't know if I answered your question with that. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I just, you know, I was thinking about, you know, 15 compliments, but if they said, thank you for your hard work, but I'm really worried about safety, that got put into safety or, and no, not. No, if, if in those, the comments were, they were pretty pure, people who were just happy. They just said, thank you very much. We got a lot out of the remote learning plan. And that was pretty much it. Okay. And so those are the, and, and, and I understand what you're saying. And some of the comments, they said, thank you very much for everything that you're doing, but we want you to consider this. And so I, I kind of utilize that. The compliments are just pure compliments, nothing else. Uh, there were other um, comments that had compliments in there, but they were like, thank you very much, but we really want you to consider this. And I did that because I wanted, I really wanted to, you know, let parents know, or like during the meeting, like we're talking now, and, and I really wanted to understand what they wanted us to focus on. So I would put it under another label. Thanks. And then my other question, um, we did, you didn't talk too much about it in terms of the actual responses, but something that um, stood out 
to me as I looked at it was the level of stress, stress and the concern um, of social and emotional well-being um, that families had for their students. And um, I just wanted to highlight it because it did stand out for me. And then just, um, you know, you've been talking about uh, it a lot in terms of the plans going forward, but, and it's here um, with uh, number seven, 100 um, comments um, or responses to, for that to just really be something that um, is being considered and supported and thought about as kids go back. Um, because even though, you know, parents really want kids back and there's a lot of wanting kids to interact with one another, it's going to be really different than what it looked like before. And I think we really need to think about how to support students feeling safe and coming back into the classroom um, in a situation that's going to look really different from what they left in March. Yes, I want to say that um, there's a continuum there, and, and there are parents that are, that are worried about the impact on their social, the, the child's social emotional well being because we have to put these health protocols in place. So, we actually had parents that wrote in their message, in their response, that they're thinking of not sending their kids back to school if we have to have the health protocols in place because they feel like the reason that you send your kids to school is to have that interaction with peers, and they feel like the the, the, you know, the negative impact on the social emotional well-being of their student is more um, important. Is, they hold that as a priority over the kids actually, you know, they're, they're more fearful of the lack of interaction than they are about their kids uh, contracting the coronavirus. And, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I know more, you know, early childhood, but I just, I, I think teachers are really skillful and they're going to be able to support students in navigating this new school, you know, environment, but still, you know, facilitate those peer interactions. And, um, but I just hope it's something that, you know, as you're doing these working groups and planning through the summer, that it's really at the forefront of, of all the work that you guys are doing. Absolutely. I mean, the, the parents really emphasize, and I want the whole community to know, I understand that they were, they were saying, like, when their kids were not in school and they're in the remote learning environment, that they didn't have interactions with their peers, and that really impacted many of our students, you know, very negatively. So they're really concerned about um, not only having the interaction, but making sure that we are considering how we're going to acclimate kids back into the, the structure of school in the fall and the spin up, you know, make sure that we're spending time thinking about how we're going to do that. Um, I would also like to amplify what you just said, Ms. Exton, because um, we have tremendous confidence in our teaching staff to have this be a wonderful learning experience for our students. And yes, it won't be exactly like it was. It'll be a little bit more structured learning than we've had, that maybe we've been used to. But do I think that they are going to create very supportive classrooms and do an excellent job? Absolutely. But we're, and we're gonna have to do whatever we can to help support them in being able to, to do that, that kind of work. But we have an amazing teaching staff and um, we know that they will do a great job. Great, um, we're gonna go out of order and take um, Mr. Thielman now. Um, and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Cardin. I have to go to a uh, conservation commission meeting to represent the Arlington High School Building Committee. So thank you, Jane, for doing that. Um, you know, I, I think I don't really have any uh, questions. Uh, Rod, I, I think this is good work. I, I would say that um, when we have a, so I, I heard this already earlier, when we have, the when we have a plan, um, it's going to be important to survey parents based on that plan. Here's the plan for the, the year <clears throat> um, that was, let's just say, for the, I guess, you know, we reviewed it at a school committee meeting on whatever Kathy said earlier, July 31st or whatever that is. And then right, like right after that, that plan needs to get published to the to parents and the community. Um, and the survey needs to go out. And we need to see what people think now that we have a plan mm -hmm. and where they fall in it. And I think that data is going to be very telling. The other point I want to make in this data is, you know, there's a there's a mixture of there's a there's a you know a segment of the population that seems to be willing to have their kids go back almost 
you know, no matter what, as long as there's reasonable safety precautions. And, and then there's a whole segment of people that don't want to go back no matter what. And so that's why this parallel remote learning option, which Kathy is trying to, it has uh, advocated for successfully at the state level is a, I think the right way to go for Arlington. So. Thank you for that. Yeah. I just want, I just want everyone to understand that when I was reading the comments, I understand, I wanted to, I actually was feeling what people were, because when you spend this much time with data, you actually can feel what they're feeling. And I understand that. So those are the things that we're prioritizing. And I agree with uh, Dr. Bodie and uh, Ms. Ecton that we do have the talent and we, we understand this. So we are making that a priority. And that's the one thing I wanted to emphasize during this presentation that I hear the public, I hear what they're saying, and these are definitely a priority for us as we move forward. Yeah, and also, this, this is related to my comment earlier in the evening, I do believe that teachers with support can find creative solutions and share those solutions across the district um, and create a set of best practices that can keep kids safe and, and teach and, 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 and learning as well. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Cardin? Thank you. And thanks, my for, screen. Okay. Uh, thanks for, for putting all that together. Um, so more just a couple of, of comments. Um, you know, one one was just there there was there was some feedback from the community on the survey. I'm not sure how much of it made it directly to you, Dr. McNeil or Dr. Bodie. Um, uh, you know, both with the the types of questions and the scale of the responses, it was only one disagree and three levels of agree. So, I mean, I think there are some design principles around surveys that somebody in the district needs to learn. Um, and, you know, there's community members who do this as, as their job to conduct con consumer research that can, that are, you know, offer to help. Um, there's certainly professional development opportunities, but um, I, I do think given the frequency that we do surveys, we, we probably should be a bit better at it. Um, then it, with regard to this, the results of the survey, I think, you know, two things jump out at me. One, one is, is the, the lower grade levels. We certainly kn knew that that was going to be an area of, of, of difficulty. Um, the survey clearly shows that. Um, and I think over the next few weeks for the remote option that we're offering and for the possibility that we have to go remote completely again or hybrid, we need to find out what the best practices are for lower grades. There are two virtual schools in Massachusetts, there's virtual schools across the country that do have lower grade levels and they are engaging their students somehow and we need to be connecting with those leaders um, uh, and finding out how, the, how they do it so that we can, we can apply some of those best practices here in Arlington. It's, it's extremely difficult to keep those young kids um, uh, engaged without a lot of parental support. That's not, you know, necessarily something we're going to be so, be able to solve. But but there are there, there has to be some learning somewhere. Uh, I don't know, Ms. Peretz, if, if you have any comments on 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 where we can get that knowledge. Um, but I think I think that's that's clearly an issue that 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 somebody in the district needs to be focusing on. So, um, uh, Ms. Peretz, did you, did you want to do, do you have anything you can should, well, I, 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 I would like to I would like to respond to two things before Ms. Pretz says something. Number one, I want to let the public know that these questions are not arbitrary. They are field tested questions. I understand, and that did come out through some of the uh, comments. But we did not just make up these questions. These questions came from uh, definitely vetted sources. So I just want to make sure that I'm being very clear with that, uh, and and let the public know that. I know I did get some feedback on some of the questions, and I. I think that's going to happen on any survey that you send out. You're going to have some questions and anybody who's done any research, you're going to get some critical feedback on a survey. I don't know any survey that I've ever conducted through research where it's just been totally okay. People have always had some type of, you know, question about, you know, this question wasn't really what I wanted it to be. So I will say that. Secondly, we are, and I'll get to it in our PD plan, we are definitely, I, I want everyone to know that we, I have taken this information into consideration and we have a lot of professional development that is happening this summer. And I will get to that when we get to that portion of the, of the agenda. But we are, you know, we're, you, you know, I've signed, you know, teachers up for a course at Harvard that focuses directly on 
online uh, instruction. And I've also, um, we've had free webinars that we have also had teachers attend. That was one that happened today or yesterday that is also uh, was uh, sent out by Harvard where we had other practitioners engaging in a dialogue about you know, ways to engage students at all levels through online instruction. So I, I understand what you're saying and I just want to um, you know, just solidify the fact that this is definitely something that this is where we're moving towards and this is a large focus of our PD uh, for this summer. So Ms. Peretz, if you wanted to go ahead and respond. Sure. And, and I can jump in too. And I think that there's, there's so much that we learned from this experience. Um, and I think that it's absolutely our concern that our youngest learners um, we need to do better to engage them if we are back in a remote learning environment. And, you know, we're hoping that that's not true. And like was mentioned earlier, we really are doing everything we can to make sure that we have those children in school because we think that that's the best experience for them. But having said that, um, you know, we have to kind of look at the way this all happened and, and kind of the ups and downs and the patterns of how this developed. And I think that our teachers, which we've also touched on, really do know how to engage students. But what they were thrown into very quickly and without a whole lot of notice was how do I engage students in a remote learning environment when that's not the experience of our youngest children. So, you know, very appropriately, our fourth and fifth graders, for example, were able to kind of go with that a little bit more smoothly because they already had an environment in which they were engaging with their teachers remotely, even before we closed. They used Google Classroom, they had experience with how to collaborate with online tools, and our youngest kids just didn't have that um, because that's not something that we did with them. So our hope is that through the professional development um, that Rod is mentioning, you know, the teachers are very much engaged in that and thinking about the ways at all levels that if we were to go back into a remote learning environment, that our children would be better prepared to do that. Um, I think overwhelmingly, though, in talking to parents and in talking to students and um, in talking to the teachers, while school was still in session in a remote way, that it was that social emotional connection that those youngest kids really needed the most. And so I think we learned a lot about how to engage kids within that environment. So for example, at first when we closed, it was about making sure that everybody was connected, first of all, because our youngest kids didn't have computers. They didn't know how to get online with SpyPonder's accounts. The adults didn't know how to do that. They didn't even know they had SpyPonder accounts. Um, and there was this huge learning curve for everybody in that way. Um, you may remember that at first we were doing things like communicating with email and then getting, those, um, getting that training into place so that those teachers could use Google Classroom so that the children could try to engage in that way. And so since that's happened, we've had a lot of practice, we've had a lot of work together, we've collaborated as teams um, and found another example like having a whole class morning meeting with a kindergarten classroom. You know, some people were much more adept at that than others at first. Teachers who felt more comfortable doing that in kindergarten than others. Or just that the children were overwhelmed from that experience at first. And we had to learn that in fact, we have to put them in much smaller groups. Um, and then even getting them into smaller groups that there are some kids who just weren't gonna feel safe in that environment and needed one-on-one -on -one connection with um, their classroom teachers and really finding the time so that uh, teachers could connect with kids and find the ways to connect with kids even though they couldn't be together in person. So I feel like we've just learned so much about this and will continue to do so um, and administrators too taking part in that PD over the summer to see how best we can do that. Um, because we can, and I think it's so true, you know, what Dr. Bodhi was saying about how talented our teaching staff is, um, and that they really do want more than anything else to connect with the children in a, in a safe and supportive way. Um, and so I really do have a great amount of faith that we're going to be able to do that. And we'll, we'll take everything that we learned and all the feedback that people gave us to make that experience better in the, in the you know, situation if we have to go back to that again. But it will be important to, to hopefully, if we can do it in a safe way, be in school so that we can create those communities so that we can continue them if we have to leave school again. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's very helpful. I, I, 
I, again, I, I think um, everybody acknowledges how difficult the spring was. Um, uh, and, and everybody also acknowledges how hard everybody worked to try to make it as good as, as we could. But I think we also need to acknowledge, and the survey shows with the 800 people who, who disagreed that, that their students had a positive experience, yes. that this was sort of a disaster. And um, uh, we have to find a way to do better. And I just think we need to be honest that it didn't go very well, no matter how hard we tried. Um, and, and we need to find a way to do better. And Thank I think you. the important part there is that it, it didn't go, so it didn't go very well for a lot of people and that we need to do better. Um, and we need to learn from that. But we also need to acknowledge that there were a lot of really good and strong things that happened. So through the whole time of the school closure, I was talking to parents on the phone, we were emailing, um, we were having calls like this online and even anecdotally talking to people through things like IEP meetings that we had online and hearing that there actually were a lot of children who really did get a lot out of that experience and really benefited from the ability to um, learn how to manage their own time and learn how to have some choice in what they were doing and connect in a different way. And so we wanna be able to, to pull from those positive experiences too and really think what went well, because there were things that went well, um, but really do better for those people that it did not go well and, and really encourage those families to reach out to us when things aren't going well because we want to make it better for you. And it took a while for us to get people to really start to share that too, to be able to say, you know what, we're really struggling. What can you help us with this? And really connect with them on that personal level. So, but I, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying is that there was a lot that did not go well and we need to learn from that and know that moving forward, we can be better because we do have the, the um, people, the talented and very caring and thoughtful people to do that work. We just need to support them in doing it. And that's our charge. Great, thank you. No more, Ms. Morgan. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you for sharing the survey results. Um, I personally would find it helpful to get the survey results cleaned up without the ones that did double comments or you did, did two answers and I don't feel, I appreciate that you've shown us what the actual data is, but to me, the message gets lost with all these little blips of, you know, one person put agree and disagree and, and stuff. And it'd be nice to see without the small amounts of, of other comments. I mean, they, they can be put someplace else. Um, and also I'd like to see, you know, you said that you looked at like where the disagree um, comments came from and that you found that they were in lower grades. Can we get that in some form? You know, could you make that into a graph for us so that we can see it and also so that we can talk to other parents when they come to us and, and say, yeah, you know, this is at least acknowledge that, yeah, the survey showed what you're telling me or, or it didn't. And, and, you know, trying to, then we can try and understand why, you know, what's different about what they're saying. Um, and oh, can, I, can I just uh, do one thing, Miss, uh, uh, and, and show you just, I want to show you how the, the survey is interactive and, and you can do this. So let me just share my screen again. Um, one second. Uh, can you see the survey now? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to show you just how interactive this survey is. So um, I, I appreciate your question. And so what I'm going to show you is that the way that you can disaggregate, I would have to send you the link, but the way that you can disaggregate the data. So if you want to see how all the first grade uh, parents you know, parents who have kids in the first grade responded to the survey, you click on this pie slice here, mm -hmm. and then you'll see the survey, the ch you'll see the changes. So you'll see okay. 
These are yeah. all the first grade parents, how they responded across the district. This is how they're distributed uh, okay. in the buildings. And then this is how they responded to the various prompts on this page. So you can disaggregate the data on each okay. page just by clicking on the pie slice. So if you click back on it, it'll bring you back to how everybody responded. And so if you wanna to go to a particular question and you wanna say, the work that my child has been getting through remote learning is manageable for me as a parent, I wanna look at all the no's. So I'm gonna okay. click right here on the no's. And then you scroll back up here, you'll see that there were 986 no's. And this is how it's distributed throughout the grades. And this is how it's distributed throughout the, the schools. So you okay. can see that. And if you hover your cursor over each one of the grade levels, you'll see the percentage of um, parents with kids in second grade. This is the percentage of those parents that responded no to that question. Okay. And then you go back down and you click on it again, and it'll bring you back to the full survey. Okay. Yeah, so that's do, helpful. Um, I just want to say one more thing, that you can only disaggregate the data on each page. So as you go to the other pages and you see the pie charts, you have to do the same thing. That's why the pie charts on an each page. Okay. Yeah, so um, Ms. Fitzgerald did share with us a link to the survey so we can play with that. Yeah, um, so you can play but with it, it different ways. It's also if, if we're trying to communicate out to the public, it's helpful to have some of this information just not in, you know, just as their own pictures, not as, you know, we don't want everybody going in and, and necessarily mucking with the survey. Um, or I don't know, maybe you do, but, but what we're trying to do is convey the story, not, not just the story that people choose to pick and click at. Sure, right? absolutely. So, um, and just to echo what Mr. Cardin said about the survey, um, yeah, one other thing that came up was that the survey, the description for the survey said that it was to be anonymous, but then it was required to list the email address. And I know at least at the start of the survey, people were having, people didn't take that kindly. <laughs> um, I think that requirement may have changed um, as the survey went on, but it, yeah, it's me, things like that that make people talk you know you hope that people talk so that they all get interested and go and fill out the survey but when something like that shows up and isn't i, I mean it shouldn't show up at all right and when it does it makes it look like the survey isn't truly anonymous or you know people get the wrong impression and and that impression then echoes down the lines and uh that isn't a good thing so, i take full responsibility for that it was a button that you had to push in order to make the survey anonymous i didn't push that button at the beginning that was like in the first couple of hours of the survey but we did not collect any uh email addresses from the survey once i found that that was happening i clicked off that i clicked on the button and so no email addresses were uh, collected. I, none of it, it is anonymous. So that was a mistake. I take full responsibility for that. Okay, but maybe we should be running it inside, you know, with a few test people before it goes out to everybody. No, I, I did I did that. Like I said before, it was a mistake. So okay. I did when it, uh, I, what I do, just to tell you the process of what I do, is I put myself as a person and I fill out the survey myself. And that was something that I just overlooked. I was just trying to focus on the questions and I just take full responsibility for that. After the first couple of hours, I clicked off the button. So it, yeah. it's, it's a, it was a mistake, it was a human error. Yeah, and, and I'm saying maybe it shouldn't just go to you. Maybe it should go to five of your closest friends or yeah. in, in the department just to get feedback on, does it, or, or go to us or something just to get feedback on is, is there issues with the survey, you know, like, of that magnitude that can be easily fixed so yeah and, and i again i did send it to other people i've sent it out two or three other people so i did it was myself and a couple other people is again I, something i overlooked human error i take full responsibility okay um that's all mm -hmm. mr schlickman uh thank you my uh questions and comments were more or less aligned with what dr alice and ampy said uh, would, would have been my hope to have been presented at this point uh 
the numbers grouped by age group K to two, three to five, six through eight, nine to 12, because the experiences are very different by grade level. But if we get the uh, ability to go and play and disaggregate on our own, uh, that'll give me some information that, that I can use going forward to make an informed decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. Thank you for doing this. Uh, that last display of being able to aggregate it, as Mr. Schlickman and Dr. Ampey said, it's, it's going to take a two or three hours of my night tonight. I really, I'm going to get to sleep playing with the numbers. I just want to express that uh, I started in teaching uh, right at the end of uh, being the source of all information and, and getting students involved. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a challenge that I think our teachers are going to do well at, but going back to this uh, being a lecturer as opposed to being a person who gets the kids actively involved and in socializing with each other is going to be a difficult task, but something I think they're going to be able to do. Quick question. Dr. Bode, you mentioned before that you think we have the space to put it if everybody decides to come back. What do we do if everybody does come back and we don't have the, the distancing or the spacing to do it? Well, we're doing our analysis with the assumption that everyone does come back. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I guess, you know, for me, it was, it was sort of interesting looking through this survey and, um, you know, we're three weeks now, I think, out of school and I feel a little less traumatized having had three elementary kids last for three months and, and oh, the survey responses brought a lot of that back to me. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was good to know, I guess, that I wasn't, that I wasn't alone in finding it so, so challenging to manage. Um, I, you know, I, I appreciate and, and fully support the movement towards bringing as many students back as can safely come and who want to be with us. And um, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what we're hearing tonight about the plans that are well underway to make that happen. Um, looking at the survey, I, I remain very anxious and skeptical about our ability to uh, build on what feels to be a pretty nominal beginning with remote learning should we need to to move to that at some point next year um so that you know there's there's a lot of work to be done in that area um i think there was you know it looks like there was a lot of feedback um i i really felt as as a parent um and as somebody you know experiencing this from mid-march until you know almost the end of june that that there were a lot of opportunities during that time to take feedback from parents we asked for email access for fourth and fifth graders dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times never happened um there were you know lots of situations like that we asked for synchronous meetings with with teachers um and that that be a requirement and that was you know no 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 we're not going to do that um and so it, you know, it seems like we've got a lot of work to do on our remote plan. I think that the survey is, um, you know, bears that up. Um, I, I'm fully on board with, with what, you know, that the focus is on, you know, return to school. And, um, but, you know, I guess, you know, it's hard to believe, but if, if we can pull that off, um, then, you know, figuring out how to create a system where we can provide, um, adequate remote learning options for kids um, so that we would have very different survey results um, is another just Herculean task on top of that. So um, anyway, I, um, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, you shared the survey with us. I'm really glad that we, we did it. I think, you know, we need to, you know, we need to do more certainly um, in, in August, um, early August, once the, you know, once the plans have been, um, developed and um, you know it sounds like obviously this team is really committed to doing that so um, that's that's great so thank you so much is there anything else that um, we want to say about the survey so I just want to again just uh, iterate reiterate the, the fact that I agree with you uh, we do need to focus on various areas uh, and I'm glad that uh, Kate was able to talk about the process that we went through in order to develop 
the remote learning plan. Um, you know, and we, you know, wanted to focus on like getting the curriculum out, getting the, the materials out to parents. And I just want to highlight a, a couple of things. I, through the open responses, so working parents, I want everybody to know, I understand, I feel the frustration from the working parents is saying, I need to focus on the moving my children forward in the curriculum and doing my job. I understand that childcare and a remote learning plan will be an issue. And so, you know, how are parents, if they're gonna go back to work full time, if we have to go to a remote learning plan, I understand that that's a conundrum that we're gonna to have to be able to try to work out. Um, you know, looking at the, the amount of engagement, that is something that we are focusing on, trying to make the, the lessons and the activities more engaging, even if the kids come back and you say we have a certain way of delivering instruction. That's why we're investing so much in online tools, because even if we're in school, we can utilize those online tools to have engaging lessons. And so we're figuring out how to utilize that, because if we can maximize the use of the online tools in a remote learning environment, I feel like we can maximize it even if we're in school and integrate those tools into our instruction. And then looking at making the assignments meaningful and giving the proper feedback. That was another thing that people were saying. They were saying the kids were not engaged and they weren't motivated because the assignments didn't mean anything. So we are looking at when we come back, but that they will count for grades and it, it will be, we will focus on providing the type of feedback that students need in order to get the, to be able to assess their own work. So I just wanted to emphasize because when you spend so much time with the information, you want to give the message to everyone that we're not sitting here sitting on our laurels and saying, oh, we did such a great job. What we're ours, we're trying to think what we did well and what some things that we have a glimmer of hope that we would want to continue on and then things that we want to build off of that. And then we want to take those other areas and say, you know what, this is where we really need to focus our intention. So I appreciate all the parents who took the time to give us their feedback. And some of it was hard to, to hear because when people are saying things like we didn't care, that's not the case. I don't think there's one person I've spoken to within the uh, Arlington Public Schools that was nonchalant or didn't care or there was some type of um, withdrawal. Everybody cared about doing the best job and we were trying to do that on a daily basis. So I want everyone to know that, that it was a Herculean task to go to a remote learning environment. It's just like if we all had to get rid of our cars and start work, walk, walking to work, you would probably start off on a certain plan, but then as you go, as you travel down that path of trying to figure out how to, you know, you know, fill that void, you're going to move in a certain direction. And that's what we're trying to do right now. And that's where our PD is focused on uh, throughout the summer. So I appreciate all the feedback. I, and I, another thing that came out in the survey is that Arlington Public Schools did not arbitrarily on their own decide to just to go to a remote learning environment. It was because the health and safety of our students and our adults that are in front of our, our students. And then the governor came out with a plan that shut down the schools and extended it to the end of the year. So this wasn't something that was made, this was not a decision that was made in a vacuum. We did this because we care about our students and we care about the adults. So at no point was there a lack of care or a lack of consideration of what we were asking parents to do. We were stuck at that place because we didn't really understand how to move forward in a certain manner. And as we went along, I think we got better at it. And I have every hope and consideration, I mean, every hope and, um, you know, uh, I, I just think that our teachers are committed. And that shows because many of our teachers, even though they had a rough spring and trying to work harder and trying to deliver the curriculum, they have dedicated themselves to joining up and having these discussions throughout the summer and in being involved in professional development. So to me, that is a, um, an indicator of the character and the passion of the educators that we have that work for Arlington Public Schools. So I really see us moving forward in a positive direction. I just ask everyone to have a growth mindset because as you try to do something that you've never done before, you are going to have some hiccups along the way. So we, I want us to work in partnership with the community and understand that we do care, we are putting forth the effort, and we hear you. So those are the things I want parents to understand that I'm empathetic to what they're, they went through because I'm a parent and I went through the same thing. And I live in a district and I don't want to, you know, disparage the district with what I live in, the, 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 the district that I live in, but I have the same concerns as a parent. So I'm living it, I'm working it, I'm a professional, and we have professionals in Arlington Public Schools where we have many teachers that are also living this. 
So we are going to put every, put forth full um, effort into trying to address the things that we need to address from the survey and things that we know that we need to address as professionals in order to engage our kids and give them the best education that we can moving forward in the fall. Great, thank you. Um, so, man, Dr. McNeil, you just keep going here. <laughs> You're on one agenda item after another. So uh, summer, uh, summer PD plan update, and I think You've, you've given us some, um, you've given us sort of a glimpse of it. Um, and I, um, so, and I, and I asked to put this on the agenda so that we could, um, you know, just get a sense of um, some of the opportunities that are available for teachers. I, I am on the, um, the, the everyone email list. And so I had seen some really interesting things um, being pushed out of your office, Dr. McNeil. Um, opportunities for teachers um, for this summer and so if you could give us a brief um, sort of overview of of what that's looking like that would be super sure so um, I'm gonna start off by saying that um, we have and, and I'm just gonna share my screen one more time because I want to highlight this very exciting learning opportunity that has uh, that we are investing in um, and this is what I've been talking about. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, can I can. Yep. So this is a, a course uh, that Harvard is offering. It's uh, entitled Developing Strategies for Online Teaching and Learning. And um, you will see that uh, there's a registration fee, but you'll see that it's a four-week course. Um, and then uh, I'm just going to scroll down here to uh, some of the, the logistics of the course, how it will be implemented. And then these are the major uh, components of the course. And these are the things that we're going to uh, cover while we'll take the course. I'm taking the course and I have about upwards of 43 educators uh, from across the district, uh, administrators, coaches, teachers who have uh, expressed an interest in taking the course. I've actually registered that. Uh, them. I've also applied for an AEF grant to help with uh, paying for the registration fees, and I've met with the AEF leadership, and I've also met with the, one of the designers of the course, along with a cohort of uh, individuals who are interested in taking the course, along with the outreach coordinator from Harvard. So I'm very excited about what we'll be able, be able to learn, and to Mr. Cardin's uh, point, Yes, we know that we need to understand how to deliver engaging, effective online instruction, and we're looking for professional development opportunities, and this is just evidence of that. And so I I'm happy to also report back to, to, about our experience as we take the course, and also as we met with the designers of the course and the outreach coordinator from Harvard, I, I also explored having a partnership throughout the year so we can have um, ongoing conversations and being able to tweak what we're doing throughout the year. Um, we also are offering a, uh, a cultural or anti-racism course that's given uh, sponsored by ideas for our administrators and uh, teachers. Uh, we have two sessions going that are gonna be uh, starting up in a couple of weeks. And we have about 19 administrators that are gonna take the course. And we have about 14 teachers um, who are also signed up for the course. We have almost tripled what we've invested in, uh, what we normally do for curriculum planning over the summer in order to make sure we understand the you know, key understandings that we need to focus on moving forward and how that's going to impact the scope and sequence of each one of the content areas as we move forward in the fall. So we have lots of different um, groups that are, are, uh, that are meeting throughout the summer that includes special educators, ELL teachers, and uh, classroom teachers. Uh, we also have um, a digital learning uh, team that's led by uh, Dr. Bisson, that department. They're scheduling to have a professional development session on how to integrate the online learning tools in many different ways. That, and we're looking at uh, that's gonna start sometime in mid-August. Uh, we also have various uh, um, sessions that are going on uh, that are going to focus on UDL and online learning. That, that course is going to start in September. That's also being uh, uh, given by, uh, that is also 
uh, sponsored by Harvard, uh, part of their professional development series. So I've already targeted that course and I'm going to send that information out to the district. Um, and then we have just, you know, various, we have two synchronous uh, uh, teaching uh, instructional study groups that are going on, one at the elementary level, and one at the secondary level where we meet every week and we talk about best practice and, and we look at research and we have, you know, I'm planning on having the reps, the representatives from the different online tools that we're going to invest in to attend those meetings so we can talk about best practice and how we can integrate those online learning tools into our uh, discussion. And then we're also going to, you know, leverage the experience that we had over the spring and the teachers who have, you know, signed up to be part of these uh, study groups are talking about the things that they did and sharing best practice across the district. So I think that's going to be very beneficial and it's represented throughout, you know, we have representatives from each grade level and the various uh, support areas. And then we have Thompson, Hardy, and Gibbs, who have signed up for the MTSS, is sponsoring a uh, PBIS Academy. They will be taking part in that. And then we have Thompson Middle School, who's also going to be in the MTSS uh, Academy focused on social emotional learning and mental health. So that along with uh, other, you know, collaborative groups that are meeting throughout the summer, um, uh, you know, all that is like taking place this summer. And then we have another math group uh, that is, we have uh, uh, teachers at the elementary level, the K-5 level, and coaches that are participating in an equi equitable and effective K-5 remote math uh, instructional group. And they're meeting this Monday and they get together and they met last, you know, a couple of Mondays ago, I think. And, and they're talking about best practice as well. So we have a very robust curriculum planning, professional development, um, program that you know teachers coaches and administrators are a part of throughout the entire summer and we're investing uh, quite a bit of money into uh, compensating teachers for being a part of this and running the sessions as well as uh, into the online learning tools that we need to be able to implement in the fall so I'll pause right there thank you dr. McNeil um, I'm going to just look and see if anybody had any questions about that. I see Mr. Schlickman and that's, and Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Just, it'd be wonderful to get a list of this. I couldn't keep up with all the acronyms and stuff. What is UDL? Universal Design for Learning. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I, I'm just very impressed by the depth and scope of what's happening and the leadership that Dr. McNeil is, uh, is putting forward. And I was going to ask the same question uh, as Dr. Allison Ampey did, is UDL went by me very, quick, uh, very quickly. Um, yeah, it would definitely be helpful to have uh, some of this written down in advance and certainly not to use acronyms when talking at us. Thank you. Sure. No, no problem. Uh, and I will, I will define the other uh, acronym that I use. PBIS is Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports. And then, yeah, I, I, oh, yeah. I, I, I know PBIS. I know that others might not, but uh, that, that, got, uh, that, that, that I understood. But uh, if, if I'm throwing out uh, my pad of paper wondering what UDL is, I'm sure that, you know, it, it's, it's a puzzle. Um, I will definitely put uh, together a one pager that has all the different things that I spoke about and I will share it with you. That'd be great. We, we, it, it really helps for us to have something in writing to follow along with. Absolutely. Mr. Hainer. Uh, that initial course that you mentioned from Harvard, is that open to anybody? Wants to pay the bucks? Well, the educators. So they, they say, you know, teachers, administrators. Are you asking if school committee members can attend? How about a retired school teacher that's interested in how to do it? I will, yes. look, I will look into that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, so the next item is um, an anti-racism resolution. And this was something that um, 
was brought forward by the MASC to define our acronyms, because I guess we do that now, which is a good thing, uh, the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Um, and it was something that um, Dr. Allison Ampey brought up uh, two weeks ago and is on tonight's agenda. Um, so I, I'm actually gonna put, put her on the spot for a second. Just, is there anything else that you wanted to share about it, Dr. Allison Ampey? We can't hear you. We still can't hear you. I'm sorry, I can't. There's too many things going on. Um, so I saw this as just a small but positive step in the showing the direction that we're trying to go. And I like this resolution because it actually doesn't speak just to our district, but it talks about all districts in the Mass in the state of Massachusetts. And I think that's important too. I mean, I think we our district should be taking these points to heart, but I think it's equally important to be applying them to the entire state. Um, and I didn't know if you wanted, I know that there, I've seen on social media that there are some other activists who have had a, a, the, I believe it's the Black Student Union who have a list of demands. I personally have not seen those demand. I mean, I haven't seen them forwarded to us. And I would hope that we can address those when they do reach us. Um, I don't know if they came to you or, or to um, uh, Dr. Bodie, but in the meantime, I thought I wanted to be sure that we at least have this resolution to talk about and I hope to pass. Um, and that, that's all for right now. Do you want me to try and share my screen and show it? Um, I, you know, I probably should read it just so that everybody, well, it's pretty, okay. yeah. I think, I, I think we want to read it. Okay. Um, so, and just to answer your question, Dr. Alice Van B, I, I think that, that um, the BSU reading um, the email that Dr. Janger sent to the AHS community, it sounds like they have shared those um, with him, which, you know, is, as is their, their, you know, their decision. And that's, that's great. Um, and that, you know, um, Dr. Bodhi, if you could communicate to him um, from us that, you know, as he, as he works through them and if he needs, you know, input from or, you know, wants to bring some of them to us, you know, we're obviously open to, to hearing and, and supporting him. So, um, and, and our students, certainly. Um, so is there, um, I guess, do we have, do we have a motion for discussion on this resolution? Should we do that first? Does that make sense? I'd, I'd like to make a motion oh, that sorry, we, yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we pass this resolution. Second. Great. Um, so discussion. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I, I am very much in favor of adopting the resolution. Uh, it's been circulating around uh, school committees in Massachusetts. I believe there are all over 100 school committees who adopted it. This is a really positive sign that uh, uh, lots of governing bodies in the state are really active in terms of addressing issues of racism, uh, be it overt or systemic. And uh, I think that we're uh, well served by being within that group of school committees. It's also going to be brought forward as a resolution for the MASC Delegate Assembly in the fall, which will probably not be held in person, it'll probably be a virtual event, but uh, school committees throughout the state will be able to vote on this resolution and adopt it as uh, uh, the policy of, MA or, uh, of MASC. Okay, any other discussion? So seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and, and read it so that um, we have it and then um, go from there. So this is the uh, school committee anti-racism resolution. 
whereas as schools have the responsibility to equip students with their civil right of obtaining a free and appropriate public education, it is the responsibility of each school to ensure we create a welcoming community for all students. And whereas it is the responsibility that every district provide to all district staff, including school committee members, annual professional development on diversity, equity, inclusion, and whereas every district will commit to recruiting and retaining a diverse and culturally responsive teaching workforce, and whereas every district will examine their policies for institutional and systemic ra racialized practices and implement change with sustainable policies that are evidence-based, and whereas every district will incorporate into their curriculum the history of racial oppression and works by Black authors and works from diverse perspectives, and whereas we as a school district leaders can no longer remain silent to the issues of racism and hate that continue to plague our public and private institutions. Resolve that the Arlington School, um, Arlington Public Schools and all of the school districts in the Commonwealth must guarantee that racist practices are eradicated and diversity, equity, and inclusion is embedded and practiced for our students, family, faculty, and staff. We must ensure our own school culture and that of every district in the Commonwealth is anti-racist that acknowledges that all lives cannot matter until black lives matter. So that is the, that is the text. So, um, so let's see, where are we at here? We um, have a motion, we got a vote. Okay, um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Schuchman. Mr. Schuchman. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. And um, I'm also yes. So that's a six nothing vote with Mr. Um, Gilman absent. Um, so, the, so the superintendent cert uh, CERT school committee focus group. I had some mixed results in my request for whether or not we wanted to do it as part of a meeting. Um, so since we're all here, I'd like to just, so one option would be to do an hour uh, focus group session before uh, the school committee meeting starts at 6.30, um, or we could find another mutually agreeable time, but I do think that there's you know, I think we want to we want to do this in July. Is that your sense, Mr. Schuchman? Uh, it, it, we do want to do it as soon as we can, but it's it's not imperative that that we do it in July. But I think there are a couple of opportunities. Um, uh, not this coming Saturday because we wouldn't be able to post it, but the following two Saturday mornings would be appropriate. We are also not scheduled for a school committee meeting next Thursday at six thirty and we could use that time. Um, there's tremendous flexibility on the part of Mr. Kuchar in terms of getting us together uh, to, to do this. And uh, I heard at the last meeting that we're not particularly interested in running a focus group on the same night with our regular meeting. So uh, uh, if any of those three options being, uh, let me look at my calendar here. Um, be, be it either the 16th of, uh, of July, which is Thursday, July 18th at 10 a.m., or July 25th or 10 a.m., or any other uh, time that might interest the committee, that would be fine. So my strong preference is not to do it on a Saturday. So, Mr. Hainer. Just a point of clarification, is this considered an open meeting under the open meeting law? And, but the only ones that would be allowed to speak are the school committee and the, whoever's running it. Am I correct? Correct. Thank you. Uh, I have, I'm open to any time. My wife is happy to get rid of me for an hour. <laughs> it, it should take no more than an hour. Um, and uh, I, I, if uh, we normally keep Thursdays open next Thursday of the 16th, uh, if nobody objects, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down for next Thursday. If I see six thumbs up, I'll make the motion. I move that we schedule a special meeting solely for the purpose of conducting a focus group with Mr. Kuchar on Thursday, the 16th of July at 
six thirty p.m. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Michael Finampi. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. I'm also yes. I will. Uh, Mr. Schlickman, would you do me the favor of informing Mr. Thielman of this? Yes, I will. And I also want to announce that we've got some more focus groups coming up. There are three focus groups for community members, which will be scheduled Monday, July 20th at 10 a.m., Wednesday, July 22nd at 4 p.m., Monday, August 3rd at 7 p.m. There will be a focus group for recent AHS alumni on Monday, July 22nd at 7 p.m., and town meeting members will have a focus group on Wednesday, July 22nd at 8 p.m. We're also working on scheduling focus groups uh, with CPAC, the select board, a uh, combination of the FinCom and capital planning groups, and uh, I've asked the town's diversity and inclusion coordinator to work with us to do a diversity inclusion themed focus group. So that's where we are. I will send out publicity for the scheduled uh, focus groups tomorrow and communicate them to the rest of the committee in writing. Thank you, Mr. Schuchman. Um, Superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. We can't hear you. Thank you. Um, I have a, uh, just a few things. The first, I want to just talk a little bit about the high school project. Um, basically, the project is going along fine. In fact, we're, by not having students in school, we were able to move forward more quickly with the renovations that need to happen in the Downs building, and that's all going fine. We did learn, however, that there was going to be potentially a delay with Parmenter opening uh, due to Eversource's schedule. However, there's a workaround with that that I've been engaged in conversations today about. And, you know, while obviously we would like to have the elevator working on the first day of school, uh, it is possible to do a workaround on that in case, and this is just an in case, that, um, that it won't be, we won't have the right amperage to run the elevator at the start of school. So that is, um, that is definitely um, moving forward. Um, we've also had a temporary planning committee, uh, I should say transition planning committee, which we have a standing meeting for, for the high school. And um, one of the things that we are working on relates very much to what we were talking about earlier. And that is how we're going to have a, a working environment with good ventilation and cooling in Fusco uh, and when we start back to school with the construction project right in front of the school. And so we've, we've developed a plan and I feel very positive about that. And so that is moving forward. And that should, I think it will, it won't completely solve the problem, but it's certainly going to do a tremendous amount to improve it. Um, I also want, this was sent out to all parents and notice that the, the the uh, school district is engaging in three community conversations over the summer. And the first of these conversations is July 15th from 7 to 8.30. And we have a number of our administrators that are going to be um, at this, with this panel. And it is going to be moderated by Jillian Harvey, who is the uh, new diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator for the town of Arlington. Um, Ms. Harvey was the person who moderated the uh, community conversation that was a town-sponsored town conversation um, the end of June, the, I think it was the 24th of June. So that is happening. Uh, you need to, in order to be participate, you do need to register and that the notice was sent out to all families. I think we, we probably should also get it out to, um, uh, you know, the Anybody else in the community would like to be able to participate with this? Uh, Dr. Bowley, can I just interject that it's also available on our website? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've asked principals to also send it out to their individual school communities. Okay. 
All right. Um, one thing that's very important, and I've said this the last couple of meetings, and it was brought up, mentioned the issue of a census. Massachusetts is, is actually lagging um, most of the states in this country for turning in their census. And our school system has a very vested interest in this because a lot of funds that come from the federal government to schools is based on census. Not to mention our representation in Congress is also, is also related to census. So uh, please, if you have not turned in your census yet, it's still open for a number of months, I believe. I don't know what the closing date is yet. Um, please do that because funding for Massachusetts is very much related to um, your completing your, your census. It was my public, my, my, my public, um, just it's, it's something that we need to do. And as a state of all states, I think, we should be able to be in the forefront of this. Um, the other is where we are with kindergarten registrations is not substantially different than it was um, the last meeting. We have 467 confirmed who completed their application and we have another 32 who are, are pending uh, and missing certain parts of the application process. So right now we have 499 students um, assuming that everyone who's pending uh, actually has a completed application. This is about 30 to 35 less than what we were projecting for this year. And it's, you know, we'll see what happens. It could be that prospective kindergarten parents are also waiting to see what the plan is for the start of the school year. Um, and then um, that's actually it. That's, that's, that's the, uh, the main messages for that report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? I see Ms. Exton, I see Mr. Schlickman. Okay, uh, Ms. Exton. Um, you, you track all the enrollments. Are you, do you also track withdrawals? And have you seen an increase in that? Um, we, we track withdrawals to the extent the parents no, notify us. One thing that does happen is that we, when we open school up, we always find, well, we had the student on our list and we were never notified. Um, with withdrawals, we can allow that, we encourage that actually at the school level and then that's, there's a notification process. Um, you can, you can contact the central registrar, but to your question, yes, we do track it. And it doesn't seem to be any, any significant difference than it has been in every year. We've actually gained students, um, not kindergarten aside, we've actually seen an increase in the number of students which exceed the number of students who've withdrawn. Thanks. Mr. Schiffman? Yeah. Um, not necessarily tacked onto the superintendent's report, but sort of in the neighborhood of what we've been talking about. Um, uh, a couple of questions. One, uh, I read uh, Dr. Janger's email regarding discussions he's having with students over the use of uh, uh, the uh, Dallas Hunter logo and possible changes. Uh, I just want to uh, send my appreciation to him for his uh, thoughtful uh, and fast leadership on the topic. And I hope that we as a committee are kept apprised of what, go what goes on because our policy requires us to be the authority to approve any logos that are used by, uh, by the school. Um, I have a question. Were we ever able to get an EL teacher for an EL summer program? I don't believe we did have an EL teach for the summer program. Dr. McNeil? Uh, no, uh, no. So uh, as I indicated before, you know, the spring has been very hard on our teachers. Uh, and there are some te our ELL teachers who normally run that program uh, decided that they wanted to take a break and, you know, focus on uh, recharging their batteries and also uh, 
be a part of the professional development that's going to take place throughout the summer. How, and then also uh, we have extended our, our uh, literacy and math programs over the summer. So there's a lot of overlap of the students that would be part of the ELL program who are also enrolled in those literacy and math programs. Uh, so what we have decided to do, and Mrs. Busese, uh is, is in, due to her leadership, she set up a small group tutoring program where the students would meet with the teacher in small groups uh, over the summer. And so um, in, very, in, in sessions that take place two or three times a week, and they are, the length of each session is two to three hours. So we're focusing on our uh, students who are at the, uh, the beginning EL students and ones who need the most support. So we have the EL tutoring. We don't have the full-time uh, summer program that we normally have over the summer, uh, but we do have the small group tutoring program uh, in place. If we have students who are not aware of that, is it are they still a able to avail themselves or is it closed now? Uh, so if you have parents that are interested in that, uh, you, I can have them, if you just have them send me an email and then I'll, I'll work with Mrs. Boussais and see what we can do to support them. That's excellent. The third, the third thing is, is that, you know, uh, we made mention earlier in the meeting of the Black Student Union and, and the demands that are being shared on social media. Uh, if any students want to talk to us about curriculum or policy, I, I want to make sure that they feel invited to come talk to us directly and have a conversation either with the curriculum subcommittee or with the uh, policy subcommittee. Uh, our door is open and we'd really like to talk to them uh, one, -on one on their own rather than uh, receiving third party notification. Uh, and if you hear from folks who are concerned, uh, who would normally be communicating with the school committee uh, in a roundabout manner. Uh, I appreciate anyone in the administration to point them in our direction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I will pass that on to Dr. Django, who has is has regular um, meetings this summer with his working mm -hmm. group. I'll pass that on. I will also ask him, perhaps before the end of the summer, to talk to come to the meeting. We can put it on the agenda mm -hmm. and talk about the where we are with respect to um, this town symbol that, uh, mm -hmm. okay. And you know, well, Dr. Um, McNeil, uh, we, we are having three conversations this summer with mm -hmm. the community. This first one is on discipline. You heard the report before. We certainly welcome you and hope you will attend this. Um, but the next one um, is going to be a listening, a listening conversation uh, for um, our parents of color. And then the third one, we're going to be focusing really on the fall as an opportunity to engage in a forum conversation. Um, Dr. McNeil, what is the date was, the, the second one is uh, July, I think it's, is it the 25th? I think it might be, but anyway. Uh, let, me, the, let me confirm. Let me conf all right, and so, July 15th is our one that's talking about school discipline, which yes. certainly overlaps with, with some of the issues that you're, you're referring mm -hmm. to, um, Mr. Schlickman. Mm -hmm. Yes, the second one is July 29th. 29th. Okay. They're, all on the, they're all Wednesdays, and they all run 7 to 8.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. The first one is next week, July 15th, as Dr. Bodie uh, commented or stated. Uh, the second one is July 29th, and the third one is August 12th. Thank you. Um, so subcommittee and uh, liaison reports. And um, before we started, before we go through those, I did want to mention in case we want to um, send this to one of our subcommittees in the packet is some communication with the school committee from the Arlington Human Rights Council uh, Commission, excuse me. Um, under uh, correspondence received, it's the second document down, the AHRC report from J July 2020. Um, I think this was, yeah, it was written on the, the 5th. Um, so in, in looking through this, um, you know, one possibility would be to, um, to consider having this um, 
you know, having there be some engagement over this memo um, in the CIAA subcommittee, um, but I wasn't sure how people, what people thought about that. So um, is there any discussion about that? Mr. Cardin. Uh, so as chair of the CIA committee, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that on. Um, I, I, uh, you know, I'm also willing to defer to my colleagues if they want to uh, create a special subcommittee. Uh, but that would have to be on an on an on the agenda at the next meeting uh, to discuss. So, uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, we can refer to uh, any subcommittee we want. Usually, when we're dealing with other town agencies, uh, the starting point tends to be the community relations subcommittee. But I think, uh, you know, Mr. Hainer's giving a sour look. So, no, uh, no okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Hainer's uh, comments and then we'll find a motion to refer to some subcommittee because I think we should discuss it. I was just going to say that Mr. Cardin and I can talk about it and uh, we can decide which one of us wants it, takes it. I, I, I go along with what Paul said, but uh, as long as one of us addresses it and uh, brings it to the committee, that's all that's necessary. Okay. All right. Um, so. Great. Um, so budget, uh, Dr. Asadampi. Can you not hear me? No? I can hear you. I, I had my mute button off my screen. <laughs> I couldn't, no, um, I was trying to wave. I think CIA is a good spot to start for this. Um, I hadn't seen it because it got buried in the things that we have to read at each committee meeting and I didn't notice there was a different one tucked in there. Um, okay, so. Per chance, would you have a motion related to that? Uh, yes, actually I would. Um, I move that the uh, report uh, from the uh, Arlington Human Rights Commission be um, taken up by the CAA committee um, at a future meeting sometime soon. Second. Second. A second from um, Ms. Exton. Uh, discussion? Seeing none. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Schuchman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Um, and I am also yes. So six nothing with Mr. Thielman absent. Um, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements budget. I'm sorry I did it again. Um, so I was actually trying to, okay, so budget doesn't have anything to report, but I hadn't been able to get your attention. Um, so I'm going back um, just three minutes in the meeting. I wanted to uh, commend Dr. McNeil for his work on the first community conversation that was held um, calling, uh, held on June 23rd, calling out the issues at time of reflection and action. I thought he really represented um, the Arlington Public Schools well and talked about some of the discipline issues and things that are gonna be discussed further. Um, but other panelists included the town manager um, and police chief uh, Flaherty and uh, I thought it was really an interesting conversation uh, to listen to, and I'm glad that he represented us for that. Thank you very much. Um, community relations. Nothing to report at this time. Uh, CIAA. Uh, so we will be holding a meeting uh, in the near future to review the Arlington Human Rights Commission report, and uh, if necessary, also um, uh, get a status update on the planning for the fall. Great. Um, facilities, Mr. Um, Dillman is not here, but I will in his stead say that there is a facilities subcommittee meeting planned for the 15th of July at 2.30 p.m. Um, the intention, this is a small subcommittee, I believe. It is just Mr. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and um, Mr. 
Thielman, and they are going to discuss the readiness of um, our 10 buildings with, uh, re with uh, relation to uh, issues around COVID-19, including things like air circulation and screens, et cetera. So that has been scheduled. Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, no report at this time. However, there's uh, stuff on the back burner that has been there since uh, we went out on COVID and uh, we've got some work to do. So we'll be looking to schedule a meeting within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the High School Building Committee, we already got an update on that from Dr. Bodie. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey, did you have anything to add to that? No. Um, Superintendent Search Process Committee, anything more on that, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, we're running through focus groups and uh, uh, life is good. Things are going well and uh, uh, the data is converging nicely. Uh, uh, so we're moving forward. Uh, Ms. Exton. How, how long is the survey going to be open? Uh, it, it stays open as long as it stays open. I mean, we never have to close it actually, but uh, uh, I would anticipate it would stay open through the summer. Okay, thanks. Uh, liaison reports. Seeing none. Announcements. Seeing none. Future agenda items. Um, seeing none. So the one question related to future agenda items, um, over email today, Dr. Bodhi asked if we wanted to consider moving. So we have our next meeting in two weeks time. Uh, well, actually we have our next meeting on Thursday, the 16th. Um, we have our, our regular school committee meeting on the 23rd. Uh, she was wondering if we wanted to move to the 30th. Um, given that, that the 31st is the deadline for the um, submission of the various proposals, or if we wanted to stick to the 23rd and the 6th. Um, so is there discussion about that? I mean, if we, if we do nothing, we're sticking to the 20, whatever date I just 23rd. said, 23rd and the 6th. Um, but is, if, there is, if there is a desire from the committee to shift forward. Um, the 30th is tricky for me personally because we will be someplace where there's nominal internet connection, but that's neither here nor there. So, um, Mr. Hainer. Uh, as I said before, I'd like to see even a rough draft of the proposals going forward. Um, I'd like to have the opportunity to give any, some input into that. Uh, I'm not looking to make any dramatic changes and stuff, but just to react to it. I think it's important for us to have a chance to do that. And one day notice, if we're doing it on the 30th and it's supposed to be in on the 31st, uh, my opinion. I'd, I'd like to stay with the 23rd. Dr. Allison Ampey? I would also like to stay with the 23rd for the same reasons that Mr. Hainer listed. Any other discussion? I concur. All right, let's move on then. Um, executive session. Right. Um, so to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations uh, with union or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Uh, conducting strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted to discuss and approve the MOA for the AFL-CIO State Council 93 Local 680 Traffic Supervisors. Um, Moved. Second. Did you have something, Ms. Nolan? Okay, <laughs> we're just waiting. Okay, cool. I like, I like waving. Um, <laughs> great. Um, oh, goodbye. That was it. Okay. Um, so uh, roll call, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Flickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I'm also yes. Um, and our intention um, is to come back from executive session. So, um, John, what are you, do we have a plan for that? Anybody? Karen? 
I don't think we're going to be very long, so. No, there's no plan. There's no plan. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's not a problem. So, Sean, are are you able to? Should, do we want to? We do want to come back, right, and do this mm -hmm. in, in public. So, I mean, so, yeah. Could we wait to the next meeting or no? You could. I mean, there's no because it's the summer and they're not. You could wait. I mean, it, there wouldn't be any significant harm um, because there's no. I mean, the contract will be implemented for the new school year. Yeah, it's technically not on the agenda for the open meeting. Oh, good point. We can yeah. do it first thing at the next meeting. Yeah, we will not be coming back. <laughs>